to the December Recording 12, in progress. 23 meeting of the Portsmouth School Board. Will everyone stand so we can say the pledge of... Oh, for, sorry. First, we have the roll call. Patty's not here. Uh, Nathan's got us uh, okay. this evening. Patty's not with us. <clears throat> Elizabeth Barrett. Pip Clues. Here. Lisa Rappaport. Here. Ann Walker. Here. Margot Peabody. Here. Nancy Clayberg. Here. Hope Van Epps. Brian French. Carrie Nolte. Here. Danielle Miles. Here. Nathan Delaney. Here. Thank you, folks. Welcome. Now, why don't we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> yes, Margo. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move items 6, public comment, and 9A, naming of Dondero 4th, 5th grade wing, to now in the agenda. Second. We have a second. Here. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. We'd like to open up the public comment. Every speaker has three minutes. If you would please state your name and address um, as you come up to the podium, and we will begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the school board. Uh, Justin Richardson, 586 Woodbury Avenue. Um, I, I'm here today, and I'm a little bit disorganized because I was in Montreal this morning and I drove down and did not bring my notes with me. I brought the wrong folder, so I'm a bit disorganized. I had facts and documents and an organized statement that is sitting back at home. Um, I have two kids. Uh, one has just finished school last year. The other is a senior this year at, at Portsmouth High School. Um, I, I showed the recently released uh, results for lead. Uh, my oldest was in Color Guard. Uh, Pre-COVID, Lister Academy was where Elsa went, I think, two or three times a week to practice for Color Guard. And um, when they read the results, they said, oh, yeah, that was where I filled my water bottle. Um, what am I supposed to say? 1991, the state and EPA adopted a MCL goal, which is the drinking water standard of zero, because there is no safe level of lead. It can cause brain damage and poisoning at any level. Um, there is what's called an action level, which is kind of a compromise, which is to say that it's not the standard but if you don't meet this and you continue to do it, we're going to take legal action against you at the state and federal, federal level. And that, that's important because I, I read just before coming to the meeting here the December 7th memo that you got, and I think there's some confusion there. And, and what troubled me was what was not in the statement, which is what has the school district done since 1991 to ensure that there's no lead levels in our drinking water. Um, we know from the DES fact sheet that I've circulated with some people, those of you who may be on the Portsmouth Parent Group, um, the, uh, since uh, it was only in 2014 that faucets started to have all lead components removed. There are threats. The, the drinking water standard is based on con corrosion control in the pipes by the supplier. The threat of lead is not in the pipes from the drinking water system. It's in the actual buildings. And that's a, that's a real concern. I see my lights already turning level, turning yellow. So what, what, I, um, what I'm very concerned about is I'm seeing levels and tests that are in that 2.5 range which means that, okay, maybe the faucet was run yesterday or the day before, so it's not showing up as a violation of a five or above the 15 parts per billion standard in 2015. They all need to go. All of the faucets that have any level of lead, because that's what the science tells us 
can harm our children. And so we're not going to solve this problem by just removing the, uh, the faucets that are above today in the most recent round of testing because those faucets might have been run the day before or the day before that. They might not have set been, they might not have, we, we don't know what that time period is and we don't want our children playing the lottery game when a kid goes up to fill a water bottle, you know, do they think, oh gosh, was this water bottle filled this morning or, or has it been sitting there for two or three days? That's, that's just not a safe position to put our, our, our kids in. So I would really urge uh, you to hire a lead consultant and take action to just completely remove this because it's extremely long overdue. My kid gets a, a lunch detention if they're five minutes late to school. The lead level of zero, the MCL goal, was set in 1990. We're, we're 33 years late to be dealing with this. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> okay, do we have any other speakers for public comment? Hi. My name is Judith Clark. I live at 33 Hunters Hill Avenue in Portsmouth. And I'd like to read a letter I wrote to the board regarding foreign language at Portsmouth Middle School into the record. But before I do that, I'd like to preface it with a larger concern. The changes that we've had recently in district leadership were touted as the beginning of an era of more open communication and decision making. And what we've seen so far is just the opposite. And the decision being made, decisions being made such as this one have, may have a profound impact on our children's future. It's disappointing at best that these decisions keep being made behind closed doors and then disseminated through rumors rather than direct communication to parents. So I am imploring you to put guardrails on these sorts of decisions so that we as parents and invested stakeholders can have input and confidence in the system. The recent decision to switch from teaching Spanish to Italian at Portsmouth Middle School is just another short-sighted, ill-communicated and out-of-touch decision. This reductive rather than additive course selection change made in the interest of a small handful of people will hurt a larger population of students and other stakeholders. Every decision about Portsmouth schools includes a component of commitment to diversity, yet this decision eliminates the second most spoken language in the United States from the course options for our middle schoolers. Spanish is also the predominant language spoken by ESOL students up and down the seacoast. Why would the decision to other these students by making conversations, conversations with their peers even more difficult be made? Similar to the myopic decision to eliminate AP classes at Portsmouth High School, current and future students and parents were not part of the decision-making process at all. Yet this is another situation that will force people to reconsider their choices to attend public school and perhaps take the state funding associated with their children out of the coffers of the school district. Spanish is an utterly useful language, and these days a more and more necessary language to be familiar with. Portsmouth schools with their emphasis on equity should be encouraging more and more students to take Spanish in order to make them more marketable for jobs and colleges. Over 548 million people in the world speak Spanish, placing it as the fourth most spoken language in the world. Spanish is a developmentally appropriate language to begin world language studies, and as a romance language can be a good starting point for those students seeking to switch to a more advanced language course, like Italian or Latin in high school, where it is more developmentally appropriate. What was the genesis of the decision? Have middle school parents been asking for access to Italian at the middle level? How many? A majority? When? Is this a change that could have been justified through data? And if so, where is that data? If this change was made, would a staff member lose their job? Has this even been a consideration? I urge you to keep Spanish as a course offering at the middle school. Beyond the fact that this change has not been clearly communicated to parents and students, keeping Spanish is simply the right thing to do. If learning and mastering a world language is really a priority, then adding those elementary school, those languages to every elementary school equally and full time should be part of the upcoming budget process. Again, if this is a priority, show it through the actions of the budget. And please allow us as parents and stakeholders to be part of the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, do we have anyone on Zoom? We do, we have two people. Okay, why don't we have those two people speak first? Okay, this is Tricia. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, hi everyone, sorry I couldn't be there tonight. My name is uh, Trisha Ross Anderson. I live at 328 Aldrich Road. Um, and I wrote to the board just a couple weeks ago about bus driver compensation. Um, and I wanna start by saying thank you. A couple of you responded to my email directly and suggested that this would be um, a good thing to talk about for, during budget um, discussions coming up. And um, I agree, but I wanted, to, I wanted to call in because I know that it's a busy time of year and there are folks that likely haven't had a chance to read that email. And I also know that we have incoming board members and I wanted to make sure that um, they had a chance to hear this perspective as well. Um, so again, um, I want to talk about bus driver compensation. Um, you know, yesterday my kids were again over 20 minutes late coming home. Um, and this is not a new issue for us throughout the whole fall semester. My kids were very frequently late coming home from school on their bus. Um, my kids are seven and nine years old. Um, sometimes three or more times a week they were late. Sometimes they were as late as 45 minutes late. Um, and as you I'm sure can understand, this is extremely anxiety producing for parents. When we don't know where our kids are, we can't communicate with them. Um, we don't necessarily know their whereabouts. My understanding is that this is an issue of being short staffed with bus drivers. Um, when people are sick, there's just not enough coverage available. Um, I really sincerely appreciate the district trying to solve this problem. I have seen the flyers. I have seen the posters. I have seen the videos calling for drivers, um, which is why I was really surprised when a friend told me that Fort Smith paid less to their bus drivers than all of our neighboring districts. So I did my own research, and this was included in the email that I sent to you, but I actually just Googled bus driver jobs near me, and I found a whole bunch of different rates for, um, of current jobs on the market right now for bus drivers, and we actually do pay a lot less than other districts. I'm talking about Rochester, Oyster River, Exeter, um, I'm talking about uh, Elliott, Maine, places that people could just drive across a couple of miles and they could get paid 20, 30% more. Um, sometimes $3, $4, $5, $7 more an hour if they just drive a little bit down the road. Um, of course, this isn't only about compensation, but compensation matters. Um, why wouldn't a driver just go a few dial miles down the road to make a substantial more amount, more um, uh, more money an hour. Um, I care about this for a lot of reasons. Of course, I care because I don't want my kids to be late. I want to know where they are after school. I want them to have reliable education. Um, but I also care because I love our current bus driver, and I don't want him to leave and go anywhere else. And I think this is really important for staff retention as well as hiring. Um, I also recognize the important and really difficult role of bus drivers. This is a hard role. They have a lot of uh, skills that they have to use at one time. Um, and this is a role that if they're sick, if they're not able to fill their job, it has a lot of impacts on a lot of people, including kids, teachers, administrators, and parents. Um, so I would like to please urge all of you to consider increased wages for bus drivers this budget season. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time and for your service to our community and happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. We have another uh, participant on Zoom. Yep, and this is Kelly. Yes. Um, Kelly, we can hear hello. you. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, my name is Kelly Cayo, and I live at 44 Melbourne Street. Um, I'm going to be really quick because I have a frog in my throat, and a uh, couple minutes ago you heard from another person that uh, spoke about our foreign languages at the middle school, and um, if I could, I would just say ditto. <laughs> Um, but I, too, am, am concerned about the decision um, of getting rid of Spanish um, in our middle school. I, I question the logic behind it. Um, we're eliminating a language that um, is the second most spoken language in the U.S. Um, I think that offering Spanish in our middle school is extremely important. If you look at the United States, we have French Canadians uh, to our north, and we've got a lot of uh, Spanish-speaking countries to our south. Um, it's just a language that I feel very strongly um, should continue to be offered at our middle school. Um, I understand that Italian is now taught in our uh, elementary schools, um, and not being able to continue that in the middle school may be upsetting to some parents, but I think for the larger good of everyone, uh, that that Spanish is just it's that language you we shouldn't not be teaching in our middle school. Uh, like I said, it's uh, it's spoken by a lot of uh, people in our community. 
uh, in the United States, and we should continue to uh, offer that in our middle school experience. Um, and I too would like to just reiterate, I, I try to stay on top of the school board, um, what's happening, what's happening in our middle school, and it is disturbing that a decision like this was made with very little, if, I mean, no communication. I don't recall seeing anything uh, about this um, being a discussion point. Um, so I would like to uh, flag that as a red flag uh, for families and the community um, to get rid of Spanish without a, a larger community discussion about it um, is a little upsetting. So with that, I won't uh, continue on as uh, my voice is starting to go away once again. So thank you for your time. I appreciate everything everybody does on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Feel better. Um, Okay, any, no one else, correct? We have Dr. Lister who would like to say a few words. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Bob Lister. Cindy and I reside at 69 Diamond Drive here in Portsmouth. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you for a couple of minutes this evening. So congratulations to all the members of the school board recently elected and those who are finishing their terms. Ask yourself why you ran for school board and why this is so in such an important part of our community, because it is a very important part of our community. Even though there aren't many people in the peanut gallery, usually, it still is a very important uh, uh, part of our community. Nothing is more important than taking care of our young people, whether it's um, the nutrition program, Spanish, um, or whatever. So it's uh, very important to take care of our young people. School board members sacrifice um, quite a bit with their family. They attend long meetings, they attend school community of events, uh, you deal with sometimes controversial issues, and many times you're being you're stopped in the grocery store with many questions uh, about the schools. Um, I remember when I was uh, shopping many times people stopped me and say, when are report cards coming out? <laughs> <coughs> But I would like to acknowledge Mrs. Ann Walker, who uh, I worked with as a fellow teacher and later as superintendent of schools. Ann has spent 20 years as a school board member, not to mention her other community involvement over the years. She has 30 years teaching fourth grade, five years before that as a substitute teacher. And let me tell you something about Mrs. Walker in the fourth grade. Using the old math, Multiplication, um, 30 years times an average of 22 students per year is, and I see some people thinking about that in their head. <laughs> um, I see some people thinking about that and, and uh, in the fourth grade, Ann might say, don't forget to show your work. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a lot of a young, this is a lot of young people in our community um, and we've made, a, she's made an impact on, uh, these students and just what, and this is just what teachers do. Let me tell you something about fourth grade. Students are usually nine to 10 years old. Fourth graders tend to be sensitive, curious, industrious, and in a transition year. At this point, they're not always learning to read, but reading to learn. They are pre-adolescents. They need to build self-esteem and there's a need for positive parent involvement. It's a crucial time, which is why they need the best teachers who really want to work with fourth graders. Ann Walker, in my opinion, is one of those teachers. Teaching is a big responsibility. It's not taken lightly. Teachers have a difficult job. I know you know that. Mrs. Walker, we thank you for your dedication to fourth grade at Dondero School and for recognizing the needs of all the students, specifically those teenagers who need an alternative approach to education and for your continued support advocating for the RJ Lister Academy. As I said, teachers do not have an easy job, which is why the school board must recruit and support the best teachers in our schools. I recently asked Mrs. Walker what her biggest challenge was. In her 30 plus years teaching, without hesitation, she cited the major fire in 1973 at Dondero School as one of her biggest challenges. Anne had to, and the other teachers had to compact the curriculum, teach a new math program, 
that was adopted and adapt the curriculum to students with many different learning styles, promoting personalized learning and all of the new strategies over the years. Just think about the diversity in the number of languages and cultures and learning abilities in the classroom, Dondero School and the other schools. Anne always referred to her first graders as her treasures. You are well respected, Mrs. Walker, by your colleagues, advocate as an advocate for teachers, mentoring young teachers, and you always had a dedication to the children in the Dondero community. Mrs. Walker, we thank you for your family. We thank you, you and your family, daughters, um, which is very important. And we also would like to uh, especially remember your husband, Jack, for sharing you for so many years. Lastly, I very much appreciate the opportunity to see a few words tonight, and I'd like to give you, Mrs. Walker, a copy of my remarks. I assure you that I have checked and rechecked my spelling <laughs> because I know how important it is to you spelling in the fourth grade. <laughs> and with that, I'd just like to say thank you again. Anne, you're a good friend. You're a great teacher. Thank you for all you've done with this community. And uh, we know we're going to see you around town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lister. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, okay, we will move on to the um, uh, yes, the um, recognition of the four to fifth grade wing at Dondero. The naming of the four, uh, Dondero four to fifth grade wing. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. Do we have a second. Okay. Do you want to talk about it? Go ahead. You go. Okay. We would like to name the four to fifth grade wing, the Ann M. Walker Educational Wing at Dondero School. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a discussion? We have a first, we have a second. Do we have a discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> presentations I think we should go down to the front can everybody go down to the front of the DS here so we'll all surround our fellow board members who are leaving us sadly leaving us just me and Ann tonight are you okay Ann? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh and I think I can take this mic Does it come off of here? Yep. Does it work? Yep. Okay. I think we will begin with Margo. <laughs> Margo. <clears throat> Margo Peabody has been on our school board for several years now. And I just want to say that you have been a fabulous addition to our board. You are smart, very smart, insightful, great with detail, totally committed to the business of the school board. Your work with our policy committee, our redistricting study committee, and our superintendent search committee has been invaluable to our board, and therefore our district. You have done so much for the school board. You are dedicated, you are committed, you love it. You absolutely love it. Wouldn't you all agree? <laughs> Wait a minute, I gotta turn the card over. In addition, you are a wonderful wife and mother to two lovely children. You are always there for those that need some help and support. Most recently, our own school board member, Hope Van Epps, who could not be with us tonight. I know you've been seeing her every day. Um, we are so thankful to all you've done for us, Margo. I don't know how we're gonna subsist without you, but I guess we'll uh, find a way we hope maybe you'll think about being on the school board again, or the city council, maybe. So Margo, thank you. Thank you so much. We have a gift here for you. And we have a point setter for you. So. Okay, now unfortunately, Hope 
Van Epps cannot be with us tonight. What I would like to do is honor her at a future meeting. And for those that are going off, if you'd like to come back, um, we will honor her as soon as she's able to be here. Again, another fabulous, committed, dedicated, awesome school board member. And we will miss Hope also. Okay, now we're gonna go to Ann. We now have the Ann M. Walker Educational Wing. Oh, thank you. Um, as you heard, Ann was a teacher for 30 years. She was for two years the school board rep, the teacher school board rep, and then she was 20 years as an elected school board member. Over 50 years of service to our school community. Um, Ann, we thought about naming the chiller at the middle school after you. But Marco came up with the idea of the fourth grade wing at Dondero School. When we were on the um, joint building committee for the middle school, Ann insisted meeting after meeting after meeting that we have chiller, a second chiller, so that the entire middle school could be air conditioned. So we all kiddingly always said to her, we're gonna name it the Ann M. Walker chiller. Well, I suggested that, but Margo came up with the, with the, with the idea of the fourth grade wing. Um, my kids, my kids had Ann for fourth grade. And what even my kids will talk about today is how they loved the legislative process they put those kids through with the New Hampshire history. They went to the state house, they visited politicians, they went to the chamber. Experience kids in fourth grade. So, Ann, thank you for that. Um, you were a great teacher. Your favorite assignment while you were on the school board was the ethics committee. We all know that. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> and I'm happy you won't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> you were all also on many negotiation teams through, throughout years on the board, and you did great work with that. Um, you have just affected thousands, as Bob said, thousands of students in the past. Your commitment has been absolutely unbelievable. You're a loving mom. Your daughter Michelle is here with us tonight. Michelle, thanks for coming. You're a great grandma. And for those of you, for those of us that knew Jack, he was a wonderful husband and you were a loving wife. So thank you for all you've done and we want you to come back and visit us a lot. I, I, I pick you up every time. What am I gonna do now? <laughs> I'll come by just to get you so that you can come to a meeting and hang out with us. All right, thank you, Ann, and thank you, Margo. We love you. This is for Hope, so we'll just save that for Hope. I left Ann so that Hope is on me. Oh, oh, oh. I thought you were bringing it over to her. Okay, I think we can go back to our meeting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. What's next? Uh, announcements and recognitions. Oh, okay. If we look at the agenda item. Thank you, Dr. Lister. The next item on the agenda is announcements and recognitions. I think, think Zach has a few things. So a couple, couple of announcements. Um, some of them are, at least one of them is late breaking. Uh, so uh, yesterday, uh, Kyle Hendrickson, who was um, the individual who was involved in the threat in front of Portsmouth High School, um, pleaded guilty in federal court uh, in Concord uh, to, uh, to, that, um, to, to that particular crime. Uh, I'm in ongoing contact with the assistant U, uh, U.S. attorney uh, who's on the case. Currently, the, the uh, sentencing is scheduled for the middle of March. Uh, during that period of time, Mr. Hendrickson will remain in federal custody uh, during that period, uh, and then we'll see what comes out of uh, sentencing. Uh, the assistant U.S. attorney, uh, Charlie Rombo, is, has offered, and I've taken him up on it, and we're going to schedule an opportunity for him to come down to speak with the high school staff um, in connection with the, mm -hmm. with the event. Uh, also, just for people in the community generally, as part of that sentencing process um, on both, the, both sides, um, 
both of the uh, prosecution and the defense, um, people collect uh, statements in connection with the uh, with what occurred. So the um, U.S. Attorney's Office is interested in uh, at some point will uh, offer the opportunity for people who want to give victim impact statements. Um, you know, and this is not a 10 page tome, but it's, it's um, providing written, um, you know, a page or two tops to describe the impact that that action by that individual had upon people in the community, on people in the school, um, that can then in turn be um, part of that decision-making uh, process in terms of sentencing for the uh, federal judge. So um, so folks should just stay aware, and like I said, we'll, at some point um, I will be bringing the assistant U.S. attorney in, um, and then I'll have additional information for the, for the community um, as we get into the new year. Uh, second one is uh, that we, in the back of the room in the press box, uh, we have an, uh, another gentleman who will be joining us, uh, beyond Matt Toby, who's here. Um, we have a, um, we had talked at one point at a board meeting about um, having someone on site to do minutes uh, <laughs> as part of part of our process. And, and so we recently brought on uh, Nate Melvin, uh, who's in uh, the back of the room. Nate will be generally that's where Nate's going to be when we're in um, we're in chambers. Uh, we'll be back there, and his duties are exclusively connected to uh, taking minutes uh, and providing uh, minutes for our public sessions. Uh, so, uh, just want to welcome welcome Nate aboard, uh, and just know that uh, we we know this will be kind of an iterative process as as he develops a style around minutes, and then you respond to those minutes. Uh, and give feedback on what you'd like to see, whether it's too much, too little, all those types of things. Uh, we know it will be a little bit of a work in progress, um, but we're excited to have Nate, uh, Nate join us. Okay. Anyone else have announcements? Yes, Margo. <clears throat> I, uh, I was invited by the Wellness Club to visit high school today, and I just wanted to thank them for extending the invite and um, let them know how much I appreciated the conversation they, um, they asked some really amazing questions about the role that the board plays in promoting our goals of wellness and how policies are, are formulated. And they asked a lot of questions on what does a strategic plan, or, or we had a great discussion on, on strategic plans, what are they and um, where do we end up from that? So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. I, um, I admired your curiosity. Very good. Thank you. Any other announcements? We have a variety of concerts coming up in the next week or so. We right? are concerts okay. every night. We are uh, doing concerts. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and I think Matt's uh, probably off to help deal with some concerts right now. So, <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Happy Thanks. holidays. Bye, okay. Well, let's move on. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The only item on the consent agenda is the approval of the November 28th, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Do we have a motion to accept the, the minutes, the consent agenda? So moved. Second. And Kerry, um, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, we will pass the minutes. Okay, the next thing, we did the public comment. The superintendent's report. So uh, we'll start with the quarterly report. And again, late breaking, um, late breaking stuff. Because last night uh, we uh, met to discuss <coughs> questions three and four, which I mentioned in um, in my existing report. But I do want to share kind of some of the. Give me just a minute here. I do want to share some of the outcomes of that uh, conversation. Just a minute. My apologies. Take your time. We have time. So, uh, so last night we we went through that set of um, that set of questions that we talked about before. So initially we had um, we had questions one and two drove the portrait of a graduate, which was around um, kind of hopes and dreams type of uh, type of language. 
what did you want to have happen uh, in your in your schools? What do you want that to look like? And then questions three and four, going back to that same data set, were effectively, it was worded slightly different, what are we doing well right now in pursuit of those things um, that you'd like us to be pursuing? What, are we, what would you like to see more of, or what are we not doing so well? Out of that conversation uh, last night and looking at that data, what we took is all that data, um, the folks at uh, Great Schools Partnership uh, went in kind of, in similar to the process we went uh, through before, uh, kind of pre-chewed that data, did some work with it, and what they did was start to identify what were the things that were happening with the most frequency and were there areas that they were, um, that those things were appearing in. And then as groups, we started to work around kind of bucketing those most important things into focus areas that would eventually derive action steps and action planning coming off those focus areas. So the three, um, the three areas that came out of that process, and I'm gonna talk about, and then there's three areas, but then we layer on top of that some very specific things we wanna see in each uh, action planning step. Were personalized learning, and I'll show you some of the, uh, some of the well, what is behind that. But personalized learning, safe learning environments, uh, not just physical safety like we were talking about a minute ago in terms of the, um, the federal case we're dealing with, but this also involves, involves social emotional safety uh, in the classroom as well. In uh, a rigorous and aligned pre-K to 12 uh, curriculum instruction. Now what, on top of that, as we're having these conversations, what folks talked about is layering two concepts on top of all three of these things things that we felt like were going to be necessary uh, to hear. And oh, let's see here. So, and one of those is equity and access. So to what extent in each of these three areas, as we have going to have um, teams break off to do this work, and I want to talk about the composition of those teams in just a moment. Uh, to what extent under personalized learning are we able to uh, very specific, you know, specifically um, identify ways in which we are ensuring equity and access for all students in personalized learning, regardless of um, their, their, the characteristics that make up who they are as a human. Uh, same thing for safe learning environment. How are we being thoughtful about providing a safe learning environment with an eye towards equity and access for all students? Uh, and rigorous and aligned uh, pre-K curriculum and instruction, um, both having vertical alignment, where where we go from grade level to grade level up, makes sense and is um, is very thoroughly planned out uh, in terms of what we're doing. And then also from building the building, especially across the elementaries, in classroom to classroom, how do we know horizontally that, that we're doing similar things as well? And then the second piece in terms of the layering for all this uh, work was around staff training and development. Now I think also a piece of this in addition to staff training, and I think Dr. Lister spoke to this, I think embedded in there too is also staff, appropriate staff recruitment at the same time. But it's how do we ensure that we have staff who has the capability to deliver on each of these, uh, each of these things. Um, and again, the goal is that smaller teams, and we'll talk about again the, the makeup of those teams, smaller teams will uh, break off in each of these areas and start to develop anywhere from three to four um, objectives, action steps, big action steps underneath each of these elements um, that, um, that we'd be pursuing over the course of the three to five year period and explicitly embedding those two other concepts as part of it. The behind each of these things, and I apologize um, that this is small, so I'll quickly kind of read through. These are some of the elements as people were grouping um, feedback that we received from stakeholders under personalized learning. Uh, it was around helping students identify and achieve uh, their, their goals, uh, you know, early identification of unique student needs, uh, elevating, uh, evaluating student growth. How do we know? Go ahead, Lisa. Planning privilege, would you mind emailing these out? I can't Absolutely. see that far. Yep. Like right uh, now so we can see what you're doing. Let, give <laughs> if me. If it's possible. Give me if, without messing up your Zoom. Without I'm gonna mess up. up your Zoom. <laughs> I'm gonna mess up. Possible, I take it I'm gonna mess up my Zoom. Okay. Give me a minute. Sorry, I just can't see. Nope. 
figure out how to do it. I'm working on it. Yep. Actually, being this close to the holidays, we ought to have like the the Jeopardy theme going. Do, do, do. That would. <laughs> we really missed it. We should have had Grand Marshal Cirillo in here with some students to make music tonight. That oh, would have yeah, been. We that, that. We've done that in years past. Yeah. That hasn't. They're performing for the city council next week. Oh, yeah. of course. You see the rates. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should, should, should have gotten them in here, too. yeah. It's a busy week. I get that. One. Yeah. Rub it in. I'm driving to like a rehearsal in a different town like that. The high school concert is the There's three. The high school is three. Well, there's a regular high school concert, and then there's like something orchestra. Two nights. One's here. One's here. Who am I leaving out? Brian, Liz, and who else is missing? I got it. I got Hope. it. Yeah. <coughs> well, it would have been easy if we just read it to us. <laughs> well, but it should have been in the packet. Nathan, I'm in trouble with you, so you're gonna you have to look over someone's shoulder. Yeah. All right, you should have it in your inbox. I had to have a heat Thank you. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Sorry, Zoom. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. You can Nate, they won't always make minutes this easy. Oh, it Just must saying. be coming. It's coming. Time is slow, but that's all right. I can look on here. No access. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Get back to Zoom. My phone is always slow, and I don't know why. Oh, it's coming back up here. We're coming back up here. Yep. Yeah, I just got to get it back set up. Okay, you got it. Ooh. Okay, um, so, uh, so as we were saying, uh, as we were saying, so it's helping students identify and achieve their goals, um, identify, uh, early identification of, of unique student needs, uh, evaluating growth. So as a district, really looking at how are students growing from year to year to year, um, an emphasis on academic support programs, uh, interventions, uh, engaging, uh, creating engaging learning environments and spaces. Um, I've definitely a lot of conversation and a lot of responses from the public about maintaining a diverse variety of class offerings, uh, uh, cultivating the love of learning and the attendance of school, greater self-capacity, real-world experiences, project-based uh, hands-on learning, uh, celebrating multiple pathways, and building student independence. These are the things behind the kind of the focus area of personalized learning in terms of what we received from stakeholder feedback. And then, oh, let me go back. And then our safe learning environment, again, this was not exclusively uh, hard uh, emergency response uh, type stuff. Uh, it was a lot talk about, about uh, supportive leadership, uh, encouraging kindness and inclusivity uh, amongst our kids and our staff. Uh, some of the you know thoughtful we have had some student groups who we've talked to in the past around reducing some of the pressure and stress that exists for students an emphasis on student staff relationships uh, on uh, social emotional learning and supporting mental health uh, the sense of community and this was people saw as a strength but wanted more of sense of community among staff and students uh, guidance and advisory programs Uplo uplifting families and students who are in need, partnerships with families, uh, and then opportunity to give back to the broader community. And then the last of the three, I won't go down through the whole thing, but it effectively comes back to some program offerings that people were specifically uh, interested in. But, but more, I would say broadly, it was around how do we ensure that we have a set aligned curriculum 
um, across the district. Uh, and how do we uh, how do we go about doing that? How do we make sure that there is continuity between what we're doing within the system um, across the board? So those are the elements, uh, and then discussion about where to go. Um, and based on our previous conversations, I I would encourage that this is I think this is the right I think this works. I'm comfortable that this is something that that uh, would would hopefully take us uh, further into making sure that we reflect the will of the board uh, in terms of what we're trying to develop. Uh, my recommendation, and this would be, I think, probably wait until the next board sits, uh, is that the new chair uh, appoint one to two board members for each of these, each of these areas uh, to run that small group. Uh, and then in turn, uh, I, our office, and specifically me, but all staff would help help recruit the people who are the kind of the people who are most embedded in that work in the district uh, to work with that particular uh, board member or team of board members. Uh, and then that, that small team could then uh, work through a process with these things in the background and awareness of these are some of the things that stakeholders were talking about. But, ha but empower those, those teams to come back with what they feel are the three to four highest leverage strategies within that particular area, that focus area. Uh, and then bring that work back to the board for additional conversation um, from those teams run by board members. Uh, so that is my uh, suggestion. I, you know, I, I don't think it's something that that's, obviously I don't, I don't think you take action on it uh, tonight. Uh, but I would suggest that as you see, see the new board, you uh, have a new chair, uh, that you consider this the, the next step and in a way to have much more board involvement in the, the um, final, we'll say, you know, half to a third of the strategic planning process. Okay. Do we have any questions? Pip? Um, yeah, I'm going to go backwards. Um, in terms of what you were just saying, um, are you envisioning that the steering committee would still exist and that there would be a group that would sort of funnel all the information into the final product? Or if not, who? how would that happen? Uh, so, you know, I envisioned a role for the steering committee before, but I, uh, my impression was my thought process, because I'm really serious about, like, this, this needs to, this needs to be something the board is, is happy with and, and believes in and that we're going to collectively support. So the um, so I don't necessarily see a role for the steering committee anymore. This becomes the steering committee. Um, the work would come back through here. It's all here. You get to be part of all, all aspects of it. You get to debate the things that uh, should go, should stay, um, have those conversations about bandwidth, about budgeting, about all those types of things, and have it, have it here with this group. Okay, so would there be some like work um, workshops in, on that work sessions or? I really envision, and that's I envision that it would be it would be work sessions type of stuff. It'd be different type of stuff, and we've talked about I think within the rules that that mechanism of work sessions, and I think that's what we would try to move towards. Is that that would be my suggestion? Yeah. Um, is that that's what we move towards? Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and the other question, I, I was trying to figure out where we were when you first started, so I think I missed this, but where did that information come from that you were working with? So that comes from the original stakeholder surveys and uh, focus groups from the fall. Okay, so that yeah. it was a strengths and weakness evaluation? So it was, was so it was two, so it was based on two, so there are two, the two questions that we analyzed this time were, what do, what do you think we're doing well Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you th what do you want to see more of? Okay, so that was information gathered back then, but it hadn't been analyzed until now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So we, not at the yeah. So the steering committee was not working with that particular right. That particular but it had been. Question. But those questions were asked. The, the data. Those, came that was part okay, of the original set of the original set of surveys and focus groups. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. I think I saw Carrie. I um, unfortunately missed that. I was not around for the conversation around um, board involvement. I just would, and, and I looked back at those notes. Um, I just would really um, advocate not to have board members run that. I think this is the part where the goals and the plans, it's, it's more important for the staff and administrators to take these plans. Um, and I think that the buy-in is going to be very different uh, having that run um, 
by folks that are going to support the implementation, and I worry about what would happen if they were run. But I'm sure there's some in between, as it's not a decision tonight, but um, either to have, you know, mm -hmm. board member involvement definitely makes sense. Um, I, it's just the leadership of those groups, I think, is my concern. Thank you, Kerry. Margo. Um, can you tell when I, I know that you want to keep those um, what is the word you use expert teams yeah not so huge yeah. right yeah. but it, have you considered um, wh where would be a place either on the website or somewhere where the general we have so many talented individuals in our community that are working on a lot of these things that that we may not know of or yes. you know yep. it would be fantastic if there was a place where there was idea sharing and data sharing of we've tried this and mm -hmm. here's what I learned or you know I am an expert on K through 8 language whatever but mm -hmm. I, I would I would hope that I think it's great to keep a working team small but I don't want to close the voice of the, and recognition of the, the yeah. variety of viewpoints and talent we have in our community. Sure. My suggestion would be somehow sharing of the conversations that are happening somewhere in a public forum, either minutes or, or whatever format yeah. that looks like, yeah. and, and, a, and an email location where folks who might have um, a real knowledge base on these topics could give input. Not with the expectation that it's yeah. going to be what the group lands on, but just sure. to keep yeah. our lens, cast our lens wide so we end up successful. I think it's a great idea. Lisa. Um, so Margo raised part of what I wanted to say, and I also agree with Carrie that we might want to have a little bit more of a longer discussion at a soon board meeting about what the best way is to populate these groups. Um, I think as I was reflecting on how our presentation went in November, I was thinking a lot about a presentation at the New Hampshire School Board Association Delegate Assembly. They have a school board association, they have a school board of the year every year and they come with the superintendent and the board chair and do a presentation. And Oyster River did a presentation on how they did their strategic planning. We obviously don't need to do the same mm -hmm. thing um, as them, but the things that I took away from it that seemed like really worth thinking carefully about is that they had involvement from a senior leader in the district and more than one member of the board at every mm -hmm. conversation from this point forward. It was public, it was noticed, it was minutes, mm -hmm. it was posted in advance. So I think, like, I don't know that I would prejudge who is the chair of these groups, but I think from this point forward, having these meetings public and available on Zoom and yep. posted and all of that stuff so that people from the community who might want to pop in for the one where they think they have expertise can just show up and also just be able to see it. Because I think that from this point forward, the transparency and the inclusiveness of it will make it a lot more easy by the end to have everybody feel like they're included. So I would just say that. And I like these buckets, but one thing I was just thinking about, and again, I don't want to make us Oyster River, but they ultimately, when they get down to the brass tacks of what they're going to implement, you know, they pick like three very concrete goals that are big goals. So I guess I almost wonder if these are still too broad and maybe that's part of what we're going to look at. Um, you know, the curriculum one sort of makes sense to me that you need to look across the board, but for some of the other ones, I wonder, would we be trying to narrow down what within sort of physical and mental health safety are the big things we want to deal with and then we map out what each of those look like for each year is that sort of how you're thinking about I'm, it I, so yeah i think there's still there's still a lot of decision making to happen so okay so inside of so that list the 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 laundry list reflects underneath each of those uh focus series just reflects what stakeholders had to say that informed people's kind of grouping but that's this is not i in my, in my mind it is you're not going to do all those, you know, we're not going to collectively do, we're not going to have a focus on all of those things. It's going to be the, the, um, the groups of people who are working within those, within those, we'll go back to buckets again, within those themes, we're going to make decisions about what, what moves to the front and what goes to the cutting room floor. Uh, and I think those are, and those things, so let's say, for example, in a personalized learning, 
if there's three exactly what you're saying concrete things that are that are not aspirational they're not kind of again not just the theme but they're like this is a thing we're going to do mm -hmm. which is going to advance personalized learning across the district here are two more things that we're going to do and here's how we here's how we um, believe that to support those concrete three things what we're going to need to do in relation to being thoughtful about equity and access and what we need to do in terms of uh, training of staff mm -hmm. so that's that's where we left it but there is definitely absolutely all kinds of editorial uh, work to be done within those teams that work on those buckets. And then I have one more hard question. Sure. I'll be quiet. But what is our intention for how long we expect this to take at this point? Like, think, do we have an idea in mind for when yeah. we want to be able to be done? I think it all depends on the process will feed timeline. So, so if uh, depending on the logistics of the number of people and types of folks you want to have involved and how much of that conversation needs to be synchronous, mm -hmm. then that will drive timelines. But my goal is to be, I'd love to be, I want to get, I want to get done. I want to get into like, let's start talking about, let's start doing um, stuff. So, um, uh, so I, I can't, my, ideally we're, I mean, this is the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. We're done. But in order, in order to do that though, folks are going to have to make themselves available in order for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Any other questions or comments about that? Carrie? Um, I just wanted to sort of, I, I don't know, like more specifics were helpful for me in that meeting. Um, and also like thinking of these as the goal was really to use, utilize the data that was collected, not necessarily the expertise in the room to come up with these focus areas. Um, and so I think that's, that that part is important to me just that there aren't expertise that are cut out, that the expertise is in the data that went to so many people. Um, but seeing that, I think one visual that helped me was that having the focus areas and then having, and under each of those will be objectives. So like three objectives for each of them. And then the goals will be measurable data-driven goals um, that connect to those. And so um, that was this piece, but as um, Zach said, um, moving to the next step, but also to recognize that um, Nate joined that group as well, so um, as another yeah. board member too, which was great and had lots of awesome input. We had some addition, yeah, we had four, four students this time, which was, yeah. I think actually really helped the process a lot, yeah. that we had more students than we had previously. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, is anything else? <coughs> Sorry. Um, do you want to finish your report? Sure. Um, <laughs> the only other thing I'll mention on, on the quarterly report is just under the uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, is that we will, in the on the communication side, uh, just an awareness that the, we will be transitioning Facebook pages, and, and that's been a bugaboo. We, we uh, George, George Shea and I have been trying to go back in time and pull apart when, like a lot of places, uh, when the Facebook page was set up for the for the school district, it was in the early stages of the Wild West of Facebook development. And so there were things about the way in which that were set up that were not going to allow us to do some other things. So we are transitioning in, in addition to some of the other social media um, uh, outlets that have newly developed that people are starting to populate now so that there are things when people arrive in January. Um, Facebook will be one of those that's going to that's gonna change. Um, and that's a shame because if there's any, I mean, the most probably from the district side of the equation, the, the most robust um, channel we've had, which is still only so, so robust, has been Facebook. But that will be something that changes as well. So we'll start letting people know as we move into January, hey, start moving over to, hey, start moving over. Um, to all these other these other channels, but like I said, right now, those folks are doing some experimentation. They're getting used to Buffer. We're having conversations about, you know, uh, you know, uh, photo ratio sizes and what works and what doesn't work, and uh, all those types of things. But that's just a heads up that Facebook would also be part of that change. So, are we leaving Facebook? No, we're just moving to a new 
a new so an additive the destination will be will be a new place but we're not we're not no we're not we're not leaving facebook as a district no we're just leaving the parents out there who we're leaving the existing page okay so do you want to continue with the e can i ask oh sorry margo okay um can you just clarify i I loved this thing about the scope and what i didn't understand about it was um my understanding from reading it is that they generate it's their survey it's their based survey. on the research they've done across the country on right. and then they gather the data and when they share it back with you it's our data and also our data as compared with um whatever exi- existing sample they already have and then in their stuff okay. i mean i wish their sample and they talked about how they've utilized this and i think it's over 100 schools i wish that was 10,000 schools, right? right. right. Um, but I'll take 100. Uh, and uh, and the and then the and then each of those surveys go out to those different stakeholder groups and there's a lot of questions about some of them are canned and some of those will be custom based on our own what are the tools we use, you know, there's not going to be a canned uh, parent square question. Right, right. We're right. going to have to customize some things like that, but it will it will get to where are people getting information how much information, you know, all those types of questions, which will give us a sonar ping on kind of, you know, what, what are our consumers of information? Uh, what, what, uh, what are they like? What are they not like? You know, that type of thing. And do they, um, do they have the demographics on the school system? So like, it'd be really helpful to compare to other school systems with similar <coughs> demographics, yeah. population size, similar. age of parents. Like, yeah. I and do I, think that makes it, Difference I on and, when and, you and I don't know. And I can't. I don't know. Okay. And I I'm curious about just because they're so. When we, so I'll, I'll take a step back. And when the some of the like uh, social emotional kind of survey work and stuff that's connected with um, pa- like Panorama Education is a big survey educational survey provider around a couple of different things. Their da- data sets though are like. You know, they've they've yeah. given it tens of thousands of times across the country to to kids, and so they have these huge comparative data sets. This is not going to be that big, but still, it's something. It's mm-hmm. something that allows us to be not just like you know, here's what people are telling us, but here's what people are telling us in relation to uh, other folks. I'll be I can push a little bit more because I did not di- dive uh, deep on the makeup of the the rest of the sample size they have um but um but hopefully they provide that level of comparison i don't know okay yeah. thank you any other questions for zach okay zach. On quarterly report so i'm going to yes. move to superintendents yes, yes. so so and i uh, and it's too bad the gentleman who, who was here uh left so um my entire superintendent report is just around lead and the lead, the lead stuff. Um, the, I think the overarching, the most important kind of things I think for the community to think about is first of all the, um, as we what basically happened is on the 29th we started to receive back. We did a, a second round of testing, connected with a bill, a House Bill 1421, uh, which was passed in 2019. Uh, or 2018, and we did a second round of what is supposed to be three rounds of testing between the passage of that bill, and then I think it's 20, the 24, um, and um, and so those the sampling was done. It went out to the state. We started getting back these. You know, here's here's uh, here's what your results are, and here are steps you need to take in accordance with this law. That included that we needed to send out the the data that I sent by statute needed to be sent out to families uh, within five days. Um, so, so, and the bulk of my, my letter, uh, I'd say, you know, 85% of it was a template um, from the state. And uh, so that's, we worked on and we sent it out. From the beginning, well, not from the beginning, I think as I started to look at, because one of the things that's available and we put it in the letter, there's a link to all the different state data um, and if you look at, and again, I wish the gentleman was still here, you look at our, in 2019, we did a round of testing. Most, of, there was only one item at the time, the, the, um, the actionable level um, was 15 parts per billion. Um, and we, I think we had a singular, single outlet, which was an issue, 
it was a sink at New Franklin School in the music room, which was removed. Uh, everything else was under 15, I think well under 15, and a lot of our were, a lot of our outlets registered uh, as BRL, which is basically below the ability of the test to detect anything. But they don't say zero uh, because they, you know, they, the test has limits. But they say basically the instrument can only go down so far. So we have a, we had a lot of outlets in 2019 that were BRL. Um, and a few that had uh, a, um, some some low levels of lead, but not much, and only one that tripped the actual um, the actual state um, thing at the time. If you look at the two data sets, um, what you'll see is that, and actually you have it in what I gave you. I compared the two. I once, as we were working on it, I, very quickly as I started looking at the data, I be, I'm, became reasonably suspicious. That um, that our newest data may not be accurate. That it didn't look like, based on reading reading stuff, it didn't look like it would make sense that there would be that much movement forward um, on the levels of lead that would be present in our um, in our systems. However, in the, my communications to the um, to the community, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to posit a hypothesis about this when we needed to get it out within five days. So um, with, additional, with additional research on this, um, I, what happened, and I think I, I think I talked through it in my, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think I talked through it in my memo, is we took samples in two different ways in those two different times. So the first set of samples we took in 2019 was done in June of 2019. It was during the school year. Facilities, folks from facilities came in early in the morning to collect those samples um, and, uh, and then send them off uh, for testing. That was logistically really difficult for the people in facilities because it meant coming in at four in the morning at a bunch of different schools because you want to get, you want to get the, first, um, the first run of the day on each of those taps. Uh, because if you don't, if you allow people to run the taps before you get to them, in terms of the measurement, the idea is that that tap will have sat still for at least eight hours so that you're not running it and then you have an artificially, um, uh, artificially low reading. But in the, 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 um, the trainings from the, from the New Hampshire um, uh, Department of Environmental Services, they talk about, they mention we really want the, the taps to be from eight to, I think it's 18 or 16 hours. 18, yeah. 18 hours. 18 hours is the range um, that it should sit. What happened with our, the samples that were taken, th they were taken this August, and a lot of those things had sat for, you know, month and a half. So, you know, so the, so the, you know, I have a real, real strong suspicion that when we we're going to reach, we, we have two things we're doing: we're retesting uh, in order to um, in order to check that hypothesis, and then we're going to then we'll still switch out all the outlets that need to be that need to be, be switched out. Um, that will be in pursuit of having a BRL, you know, below reading level. Uh, measurement on all of our stuff, um, but I will tell you that this is a process that Vermont passed legislation. Uh, all it was, it was, let's see, New Hampshire was, was an 18, Vermont was a 19, but Vermont did not give us any. There was no lead time. It was like we're starting tomorrow. Uh, not we're going to do a couple rounds of testing and then we'll slowly phase it in. It, we went from 15 to four parts per billion, and we, get, we were given a two-week notice, and then we started the process of doing this work. Um, the, I will, the only thing I'll say is in terms of the pursuit of BRL across the board is we really struggled um, with a couple of, it was just a couple of faucets, and we replaced lines, we replaced faucets, and we still had like readings that were like 0.5. Um, and, um, and the, and the analysis was that without shutting down the school, ripping apart walls, 
doing some of that stuff that we were going to really struggle. In some cases, what we did is we were able to do filters at the location where the faucet was. Um, so, the, so I just want you to be aware. We're going to retest. We're going to see where we're at. Our goal is to be lead is to be completely lead free. Um, but I also going to come back to you if there if there are questions around the feasibility of doing that. That talk that get into really large budget or disruption of operations. I'll come back to you so we can have a conversation about what do we want to do. Um, my hope is that as we take these couple of steps, at one as we do retesting, a bunch of these are going to come off the board to start. Uh, and then the few that are an issue at the five parts per billion level we resolve through um, through outlet changes. Um, so that's what we're that's what we're up to. Uh, I also let you know that uh, Kenny and I are going to Swag tomorrow night to also talk with Swag uh, about this. I've already talked with um, with one of the co-chairs. Um, once the stuff came out, we had a good long conversation. We talked about some of, exactly some of what I'm sharing with you. Uh, right now, but I did want to go back to the idea that the school district hadn't done anything since 1991 in relation to this. The truth is, uh, you, the school district was in very good shape in 2019. So, um, and I, and I, um, like I said, I, I hypothesize that we are still in really good shape. Um, but we're gonna, like I said, we'll retest and then we'll switch out those things. So, I don't know if anybody. Any questions, Margo? Can you clarify? I know there is miscommunicate not on your part there's misunderstanding around the water refilling stations and yes. how those tested can you share that those are all <laughs> those are all brl those are all brl those are all no no lets no problem. So all the water b filling stations were all were all clear at every school at every school okay so the um the bubblers that i mentioned here are some old school you know, lean over, lean, yeah. yeah, lean over, you pounds. know, back in the day, water bubblers. Um, the water filling stations we have, <laughs> most of them, uh, Nathan, are most combo, they're most combo. We've a got lot, a, lot we of a bottle and we've got most a thing. Are new. But there's filtration at the site. At the, at the, the unit. That's the thing. The unit itself has filtration at, this, well. at okay. the site. So that is, you know, regardless of what's happening in, um, in the lines or things along those out like mm -hmm. that. The, the unit would resolve it anyways. Right. So, okay. Yep. Thank and that's where, and, and culturally, for, <clears throat> for a while now, we've been trying to move students mm -hmm. towards water billing, uh, filling stations as our means of hydration. Uh, anyways, partially, um, really primarily more about the environment and having kids have bottles and do all that type of stuff. Um, but, um, but that has been the push. That doesn't mean that every kid in the district exclusively uses um, water filling stations, but that has been the move of pre-me uh, to try to do that. Right. Carrie, just a quick clarification for those that didn't grow up in New England, that a bubbler is a water fountain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you never yeah. heard of a bubbler? <laughs> when you say bubbler, in my mind, it's like a the bubble machine. Uh, the water tipped upside like, down. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Because uh, <laughs> it bubbles when you. Uh, there you go. Right, and that's. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about the? So we and of course we like I said I think I mentioned here we will report back to the board as we get additional information and then we will report back to the public. So. I did have. Yes, Kerry. Um, retesting, is there a cost to the district? And is that where are we at in the mitigate? This, if we think we do have to mitigate, where is that budget so, coming so from? So originally, uh, well, I will I will blankly look at Nathan because it's one of those, like, <laughs> we're just going to find it. Yep. So under, and again, going back to my previous experience out of state, uh, Vermont state government funded, like if you had to switch out a water, a water faucet, there was a, you get reimbursed for switching out the water faucet, a bubbler, you get a portion of that. If you had to switch on a line, you got a portion of that. That is not the case in the New Hampshire legislation. <laughs> um, and so um, this is one of those, you know, when I look at Nathan and I say, go find it. Um, and so that's what, we'll, that's what we'll be doing. I don't think our testing costs are gonna be through the roof, um, but, the, um, but it will, there will be a chunk of change associated with you know, switching out um, some of the stuff, but but what's key? And I thought this was a really good point from when I was when I was talking to uh, Erica, who's connected with uh, Swag. It was well, how do you if you go switch out all that stuff and then you don't test in advance? 
how you how are you going to know whether you just solved it was all faucets and, and that was the problem. I mean, thought it was a great a great point. Yeah. And so we went from I think the idea was it you know the original conversation I had with Kenny was Kenny I need you to retest. There was we identified it was like ten different um, things that we thought could could test the theory. Um, and now it's like I want them all done. I want all the all the ones that that showed levels. I want to retest those to, to uh, just to check to what extent sample error is showing, making things more concerning than maybe they actually are. And then we will still mitigate um, with speed. I, so. And I, one thing I was thinking about is like we have those flushes, like the public water system flushes yep. that come through where you get all sorts of hard, like, and yeah. so if that happened in those months prior, it's we, more of a we, system. I want to make sure it's really. I definitely want to make sure for our municipal partners. I'm really clear that I don't. I don't think. I don't. We do not believe at this point that there's. That we we really we think this is localized and it's either a testing error or there's corrosion within um, within um, you know faucets and stuff themselves. Uh, we don't think there's any issue with what's coming into our schools from the from the city. Go on. Um. Do we know if other school districts are facing? Oh yeah, so we, so so there is. This is all over the state. People are doing this testing. Um, one of the larger districts in the state we were just talking about. I won't quote this, the district, but I mean they're in the midst of, of switching out more than 250, um, two more 250 outlets. So um, so this is a. Uh, this is, you know, something a lot, a lot of people. If you go online, I think what I encourage people, they, you want to understand the context of where we are in relation to this. Again, with me saying, I think that these this sample is inflated. Um, if you go and look at the context, you're going to see most districts in the state, almost everybody is in the process of switching out some stuff. So, mm -hmm. hey, Ian, this would involve some overtime, though, wouldn't it, in terms of our staff? Yeah, if we're going to do it fast, I mean, originally, so originally the conversation we were having is could we turn this all around? Well, some of this is going to be staff and some of this is going to be contracted. Okay. So, um, and we were having some conversation about whether or not we would have the ability to turn this all around before Christmas. Um, and that was hope. I think I'm going to gum up the works because I want, I really want to make sure that we, we do, because we were going to already remediate and then test again post remediation, but I really want to do a round of testing first, pre-remediation, and then test again. Yeah, because I know so. there usually is not much overtime, but there, there might be in this There could case. be. I mean, I think this is, I mean, this is one of the, yeah, this, there will be costs associated and with this. And it's important. And it's, but it's important. That's just it. And for a health-related thing, we're, we're going to make sure we find the ability to pull it off and pull it off quickly. Thanks. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I think. Oh, okay. Um, the email correspondence summary, that's all there. Well, I'll just, uh, I, I, want to talk about I would just say the thing, so we're, the email correspondence, I just spoke to drinking water. Um, Spanish, I just want to make sure it's clear that what is occurring right now, not just in regards to Spanish, is we are trying to finalize our, like, whole scale budget proposal for a bunch of different things uh, around the district. Uh, and we are not done yet. We have conversations. We have another round with principals coming up. Um, two more rounds with principals. Uh, we are we are not done by any stretch of the imagination. We have had some internal conversations with folks because I think this is what should happen. If we think there's a possibility of someone's position being affected, we have conversations with people in advance because I don't think it's ethically. I think it's not appropriate for us to present something to the public where an employee finds out that their job is potentially affected in some way. I just don't think that's the right way to treat our employees. And um, so we, we are, are in the midst of internal conversations, which include foreign language. Um, but uh, we, in terms of the decision making process, we would not, you know, if we had a proposal in relation to this stuff, we would, we would be bringing it as part of the full budget proposal in January. And then we would have a month and a half to have very transparent conversations about what we're doing, what what we propose, um, why we're propo uh, proposing it, um, all that sorts of stuff. So this is these types of decisions are not ones that we, you know, we. I want to make sure people understand we're not trying to make decisions under the cover of darkness or or slide things through or 
do that sort of stuff. So we will come to a final decision about what we're going to propose to the board, and then we'll have that conversation in January. But it is not, those things are not done. So. Okay. Lisa. I just have a quick question about the email correspondence in terms of Spanish, just process wise. Because we did hear from, I mean, I know this was done like way back December 7th. We've heard from right. more than a dozen people yep. by email. Lots of other people have communicated other ways. So I'm curious if there was a decision that was being made about changing to world languages. Would that only come up in the budget process if you were looking into changing the number of full-time positions? Or would that come up in the budget process if you were also just looking overall at changing the direction of the instruction? Just so people yeah, yeah, yeah. can understand No, that's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, the, that's, that's a great question. I think because of the nature, the, the boards had a rolling conversation about foreign language, and especially foreign language. and. My understanding, and of course this is I always, you know, I'm taking stories from other people, is that, that that conversation about extending foreign language beyond the middle school down into the lower grades has been a rolling dialogue and wish for multiple years. Yep. Uh, and so, so yes, I would expect that the, um, that, that would not exclusively be uh, a conversation that was brought to the board and or the public based on I need a position or I'm cutting a position. Okay. It would be a conversation about programming. Okay, that's helpful. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Yes, Kerry. I think it's for Nathan, but I just wanted to ask about the bus driver compensation because it oh, great seems like we would be <laughs> using the same contractors that all the other districts around are. So I, the quick, I guess the quick answer is to clarify, we don't set wages <clears throat> for bus drivers. We don't employ bus drivers. We have a contract with Student Transportation of America for our uh, STA for our, um, our our big bus home to school routes, uh, and with Durham School Services for our specialized uh, transportation. Um, I certainly will pick up the phone and have a conversation tomorrow with our uh, our um, terminal leadership and just say, "Hey, you know, we're, we're budgeted for 13 buses and we're running nine routes." Occasionally there's a tenth, but more often there's an eight. There's, we're down to eight because of illness. Um, I think we were disappointed that that all, that was the de, that's what the roots were delivering last summer or last spring when we got done in June. We were hopeful that we'd see an uptick and some additional drivers and more routes running this year. Um, and I'll ask. Um, remember, we're in a multi-year contract, and all of the all of the wages and benefits that uh, drivers receive are built into that. Um, and to be fair, over 20 years there have been times when uh, the rates being paid by the company to the drivers have been at the table discussed when we're negotiating what our contracts will look like. In most cases, I have found that the, the companies working in the Seacoast recognize that they're working in the Seacoast, and part of the reason why we pay more than, than a guy next door might pay is because we're paying for them to be able to compensate drivers more competitively. Um, not just because they can't secure people, but because the standard of living is higher in the area. So uh, I'll ask tomorrow, though, and see how we stand. And um, uh, and I and I don't know. I honestly, I don't know where that data exists. Where I could get first students driver rates that they're paying in the Exeter contract, because again, Exeter doesn't employ. But uh, my wife is not watching at home, but she's the business administrator in Oyster River, and they own their own buses and hire their own bus drivers. And I will definitely check on her rates, what she's paying. Um, and we can talk about that in the future. I'll come back. But again, right now, we're disappointed that we're not able to find more. And yeah, I've seen the same postings and signs. We're certainly fighting hard to help the bus company to find more people. Unfortunately, the, the training and certification licensing process can be three plus months. Yeah. So even if somebody walks in the door today and says, I'm so excited, I want to do it, it'll be, it'll be April <laughs> before they have finished their training, their safety training, um, and all of the other compliance testing they have to do, and then, um, and then get the, the nod from the state to be able to do it. So um, see what I can find out about salaries and such and come back. It's a great question. And I appreciated her concern and, her, <coughs> and the information that she gathered. Because there may be resources out there I haven't seen recently that will tell us more and that can help empower and inform uh, the folks at STA. Yeah. So. Thank you, Nathan. Any other questions? 
Zach, are you finished? No. No, test data. So I'm going to pinch. Testing. I'm going to pinch muscle. it. Uh, <laughs> Patty is not uh, with us tonight, but she was uh, had pulled together some standardized test data. And I think was trying to, based on previous conversations, I think folks had talked about not having seen some of the breakout um, of different groups and what what those uh, what was happening within within groups. And um, so I will do my best to uh, pinch hit uh, with some additional to, to provide some additional context. What I'll tell you is that within, I, I think first let me just tell you the take the takeaways for me if I was you and I was flipping through, you know the things that I would that would stick out to me at first glance would be um, the difference between uh, some of our student groups and then the. Um, what's happening in terms of outcomes in relation to our uh, students who are uh, English language learners uh, and students who are on IEPs uh, and then students who are, um, you know, uh, uh, Latinx or uh, Hispanic uh, heritage. And if you looked at just these, um, these things, those would be the ones that jumped out to me. I'd say, huh, those look a little bit different. Um, what, you know, what do I, what do I think is behind that? How concerning it is. Let me also put just into context what you don't have in what Patty pulled is trying to think about, okay, here are the number of kids who are proficient or not proficient in different areas, but um, did, uh, how, does that, how does the state of New Hampshire uh, look in comparison to Portsmouth? So the really quick stuff, um, just to give you a broad kind of picture, uh, and I think this is reasonably reflective of what happens grade level to grade level is um, Portsmouth generally in, um, in terms of where the state is on average and our kids are in terms of num percentage of kids who are proficient, we run 15 to 20% ahead of the state um, in all areas. And uh, so for example, if you look at our overall as a district, uh, well if you look at the state at all the grade levels that are tested in terms of English language arts proficiency, uh, the state of New Hampshire is 52%. Of, stu of students across the state uh, here in, in um, Portsmouth School Department, it's 76%. Um, math proficiency uh, across the state based on the assessments that, that uh, we use, 42% across the state, 64% here in Portsmouth. Uh, science proficiency, 37% across the state. People who are in science circles will tell you there's a lot of argument and disagreement about the nature of the science <laughs> assessment. Um, and what it does is what it does evaluate and does it what it doesn't evaluate well but 37 percent across the state 55 percent here in um, Portsmouth and then in terms of English language learners who take a test called it's an, called access um, 30 percent of, of EL um, students across the state are uh, come up as proficient on that uh, test here in Portsmouth is 58 percent of uh, students so we're running we are running in the top um, most, I think all those major indicators are all in the top 25% um, of the state. Uh, and if you look at some other data, which Patty did not include, but I just wanted to mention, if you start to look at those groups, another measure that the state takes a peek at is something called uh, academic growth, uh, and it's, and it's uh, the acronym for it is MGP. It looks at average, average growth from test to test from grades four to eight. So it gives you an idea of like kind of what's the value add in some cases of a school district, like not just where a kid ended up, but where did they start and how far did we carry them? Uh, and the middle kind of the middle measure of that of like kind of a, what the anticipated average growth would be for a kid around the state is 50%. Uh, we're generally uh, where 50 is the number, it's not a percentage. 50 is the this rating. Uh, we are generally in all our different areas above, uh, generally above that. In with our um, uh, students who identify as Hispanic, though, we are just below in ELA, just below that 50 mark at 48. Um, so it's not they're pre, that group of students. Even though it's the the outcomes are lower, the the amount of growth that's happening within that group is not dissimilar from other student groups. So then the question becomes, okay, so some of those students are starting further behind than some kids. We're moving them along in a similar clip. Um, but what can we do then 
if in that uh, group to to do a year and a half's worth of growth or a year and a quarter and make up make up over time. But in that same group, again, if I looked at the bar charts, I'd be I'd be thinking about this. Within that same group, within math, um, that group is significantly above at at fifty at fifty nine, and is one of the highest moving groups in the district in terms of that measure of how much what's the average gain. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then when it comes to the students who, in special education, it's not uncommon that students who have educational disabilities are not moving at the same growth rate as, as some, of their, um, uh, some of their peers. But it was only slightly off the pace. It was a 48 on ELA and a 46 uh, on math. Uh, in terms of thinking about that, again, 50 being that like kind of targeted movement um, for kids. Uh, on the EL students, I just wanted to, to just in terms of numbers, that's about, it's about 70 kids in our district, low 70s, that take the access test in terms of trying to think about that. Uh, not on this, well, it was on this, but you have to be really good at kind of parsing through. I think an area of interest in terms of a lower performing kind of grade level in the 2013 stuff was sixth grade. Um, and I don't know, it's a, it doesn't, it looks weird compared to some of the other stuff. The sixth grade is still above state averages across the board, uh, but it didn't. It wasn't in that like 20 points of difference. It was kind of it might have been 10 or maybe sub 10 in terms of the buffer between us, us and the state average. So I don't have the answers to that, but I think you know it's, uh, it would be an interesting exploration of what do we think was behind some of those sixth grade scores. Uh, last one I'll mention is just in terms of trends, in terms of like a, looking at a couple of years, um, what what's you know what have things looked like uh, in science? Things are actually kind of on an upward trajectory over the last couple of years. In 21, 44 percent of our students were proficient. 22, 46, and then in 23, 55. So there's a there's an upward trend. And remember, the state as a whole this year was at 37. Um, on math, um, I'd say even-ish with a little bit of an uptick. So in 21, we're at 61% uh, of our students uh, uh, proficient. We moved to 64 in 22, and then 60, and then stayed at 64 in 23. And not pretty pretty similar uh, in ELA. We were at 73 in 21, and then went 76 and 76 in 23. I apologize. This stuff is not not up. This is stuff I put together this evening. To try to create some additional context so up around what Patty had provided you. So, any questions, Carrie? Um, this is great and super helpful. Um, I think this is something I feel like we've asked, I've heard asked for many, many times, and we're, yeah. was told it wasn't possible. So it's really cool to great. see it here. Yeah. Um, I would. Uh, and and as this comes up, um, I don't necessarily think it needs to be like a board thing, but the alignment of the curriculum mm -hmm. in the strategic plan and really looking at uh, these data. I learned a lot last night from the students about their transition from Greenland and Rye yes. and the where everyone is coming from. And so similarly, and especially with that growth, sixth grade is a is a transition to middle school for everyone yep. Yep. Um, yep. from smaller schools. And, and so I think though, but looking at that and uh, as across our elementaries too, and hmm. seeing where um, the transition can be supported and aligned better, I guess. I think it's a uh, I think it's a really interesting. You know, we talk about kind of the having a hypothesis about why maybe something's happening. I know um, if you talk to sixth grade teachers at the middle school, they talk about students coming in from. They, they can tell you which school they claim based on a, little, a couple day, you know, a couple weeks in class. They could identify without you telling me telling them which elementary school they came from inside of Portsmouth, and then which town they came from if they were coming in from from outside. Uh, and a lot of that is some of that's a lot of it is curricular, uh, and that the, it's not aligned. Now I know uh, Dr. Zadovic in um, 50. We talked about this last night. Is very open, and we've already been having conversation. We started with social studies last year and having some some conversations about social studies because we do radically different things in the social studies in the gr grades that lead up to it. Um, and then we're interested in having more ongoing formalized conversations with 50 um, about how do we create 
that vertical alignment between you know our feeder schools and, and what we're doing um, and that will be a work in progress but but I can tell you Steve is very open to those conversations and has been a great partner great. Thanks. I think we had Ann and then um, Lisa well my comment was was pretty much what you said in terms of sixth grade it's a it's a transitional kind of thing yep. in fact years ago when when a topic had come up about about uh, not having separate elementary schools but going K to two and that kind of thing and the discussion was that each time you had a transition to another school you had a loss yeah so so that's what I see but I, I was happy to see that the science is upticking because that's been weak right yeah. along. And, it, and it's hard I, and I think that's it's not it's not uh, I think in other states trying to find the right science assessment has been a challenge in k-12 uh, too and um, and so um, I think it's easy, yeah, if you don't have the context of like what's happening in the state of New Hampshire in terms of scores, you look at it and go, oh my God, what are we, what's happening with our science scores? But actually when we're, you know, compared to the state, it's actually one of the, one of the areas where we're the most separated from, from the, the average kind of state score. Yeah. So. Getting better. Yep. Yep. Definitely an uptick. Thank you, Ian. Lisa? Um, I agree with Carrie and Anne. I think it's really fantastic to see this broken out this way. This is the kind of breakout that we've been hoping to yeah. get, so it's really great. Um, I think the transitions are an issue. I would also add, I think anecdotally at least, that the high school English and math teachers could similarly look around the room and say which district kids are coming from based yep. on how yep. they're doing in so ninth grade. Um, and my one question, I guess, is about special ed when we get into the budget discussion. I'm sure that'll be in the mix in some way. Yes. And when I see just the disparities for that group, and I know that we really just, no matter what we do budget-wise to add Paris, we're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least with the job market the way it is, we can't really control that. So I'd love to know what else can we do to support students who may need either testing accommodations or how what creative things can we do instruction wise to differentiate things for them and i'd also just be curious like how many of those kids actually have testing accommodations you know because i Most, wonder if there's an opportunity to identify more kids who might need support yeah who don't have it because not all kids who have ieps or 504s yeah. have it for learning disabilities. I mean, there's a whole mix of kids. That's a lot of them, but it's not all of them. So I just guess I'm curious about that piece. And I can, too. I, can okay. I can bring back some, some, yeah, some data. I do, I, I do know that there's like, there's intensive work in, and I, have, I haven't parsed through it here. I mean, very often at the IEP table, there is conversation about testing accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, and I know here that, the, that at least the high school, I've definitely had conversations with the high school team about the the month of work in advance of state testing where they're just working on exactly that, doing the work they need to do with the state in order to make sure the students are able to use their accommodations as part of the testing process. Um, so I do think it's worthy of a deeper, a deeper dive. Uh, and I do think, I have to go back and look at the state data, but I do think similar to other things, our students who are identified as having an educational disability also score higher than other students around the state. Um, but of course, you know, we never want to be, you know, we don't want to sit and have that type of discrepancy. So I, I agree, it's worthy of a deeper dive. Any other questions? Margo. Um, not to beat a dead horse, but definitely they're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Board's been asking for this data for four years, huh. and this is the first time we've seen it. So, and it is super informative, and it's, it's the data different, driven decision making that we've been when talking about. So yeah. for me, I think that's great. I agree what jumped out to me was the, um, the decrease in proficiency at the transition years. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think Carrie's suggestion of when we take a look at that building the rigorous aligned curriculum, I think we have to make sure this data is incorporated into that and how do you build out and then come back together and I and I love hearing that SAU 50 is involved because I think um, for years the board has been talking about the transition to high school and the, the cliff mm -hmm. that happens for Portsmouth mm -hmm. kids versus some of the others and I think the data is helpful the, the only other thing with the IEP students that struck me as interesting was that that seemed to be the area where the science was where where in science they the, the gap was the greatest. Mm -hmm. And so my question was related to accommodations. Is, yeah. or do we not have the training 
mm -hmm. for those delivering services and the accommodations. You know, manipulating microscopes and using small instruments yeah. for some students, we may not have the adaptable equipment, and that's worth considering from a budget perspective yep. or grant writing to increase the access to um, that information. Thank you, Margo. I, I have a question. I know Hope was concerned about um, how the math tutors have worked out um, since we've had them. Would this data indicate that the math tutors are a successful program for us, I, would you say? I think, I think there's a larger conversation to be had about that. So I, I think this is a data point, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but, um, but I think, I think as we, as we, over the next couple of weeks and then as we come back to you, um, we'll have to talk more about what, what do we think in terms of the success or the lack of success of, of those math, math interventions, yeah. It's the best I can, yeah, right now. I, would, I, don't, I, don't think this, I don't think this is a definitive data point one way or the other. I guess is the fairest way for me to ask, answer that. And just one last comment. I, I used to do the, the NAEP testing, the nation's report yes. cards, and, uh, and, and our kids did really, really well. Yes. <laughs> yep. I mean, and that's, you know, we, uh, is where. And I mean, across the, the state, across, <coughs> across the country. Yes. Yep. And I think the, um, you know, I think, I think what's interesting, I think one of the things, I think the other thing that jumped out at me is, again, the data that I was giving you, the, the trend data was 21, 22, 23. So we're, we're kind of like in the midst of COVID y stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't have the, I don't have a pre COVID number that might be interested to look, I might be interested to see that, like a 19, like 2019. What does that look like? But I don't see, you know, it, the, the trend looks reasonably, positive, you know, for the most part. Um, uh, it's not like we're, we we're in trouble and we continue to slide as a result of, of gaps. I think all those things are present. I think it's also, you know, it's just a good sign. It's a tribute to staff and to some of the systems we have in place, even if those are not exactly the same from building to building, that, that a lot of the work that's being done is, is good, strong educational work. And um, so, so it's good news. I think it's, it's really, it's nice to be in a situation when we're talking about strategic planning and we're not at the same time talking about this like a pre precipitous drop in the the outcomes or some of the measures that we, we see in the district it's great to be in a position where it's like okay we're still we were strong we continue to be strong um now how can we how can we be more equitable in the way in which we approach that how can we um how can we continue to have a, a wide diversity of, of offerings those are great kind of conversations to be able to focus on and not have to worry about, oh my God, the ship's taken on water. Because um, I don't think that's where we're at. So. And see, with NAEP, we did fourth grade, eighth grade, and 11th. Yep. And, Which gives and, you a great seminar. And and actually, to you know, you had to get, kind of give the kids a little pep talk because it, it meant nothing to them. Right. You know. Right. And I would tell them how, you know, fourth grade had come in first, middle school yeah. had come in second. But I said, you can make it first. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> and, they, and they perked up and tried a little harder. I bet you they tried harder for Mrs. Sure, Walker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are we finished with that discussion? I think so. Thank you, Zach. You're welcome. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, Nathan with the financial memo and report. Or is that Zach yep. who's going to talk? No, I, I would just say very little, very little uh, news as it was, uh, you know, as compared to last month, so um, I added a couple of notes. There's a couple of things that are changing a little bit, but everything continues to look like we have talked about in the last couple of months. Um, happy to take any questions there, but thought I'd also give you just a quick update on CIP. So uh, today we presented our CIP um, plan for the next six years. We presented it to the subcommittee of the planning board. Uh, Zach and Kenny were with me, and we met with this group, gave them a, a high-level uh, summary. Uh, we brought that CIP <laughs> to you as a draft back at the end of September, 1st of October, as we submitted it to the city. Um, it includes a continued focus on continuing uh, uh, paving replacement. We did Dondero paving now at the high school over the next two or three, four years, uh, roof repair. Uh, uh, New Franklin's on the docket for a section of that roof and then the high school, a lot of roof work over the next few years. Uh, the biggest new thing that was in there 
uh, is a, a call out that we talked about today f um, to out six years to fiscal 3031 where the state's biennium um, we've talked about before uh, shows our CTE center, our career and tech education center coming up on the 25 year rotation for uh, state support for some renovation, which is renovation not just to to um, modernize or upgrade, but it's to address new program needs and things that might be coming. What I also told the committee uh, when we were there was in the decade that follows, Portsmouth High School hits 25 years on those systems, so mechanicals are going to need some significant upgrade, rooftop units, the chillers, the this, the that, and, and that's not tens of or hundreds of thousands, that's millions of dollars um, when you think about the scope of that building. And right on the heels of that, the middle school will hit 20, 25 years, and we'll be assessing those mechanicals as well. So they saw that. Just so you know, the full CIP presentation will be made by all of the departments of the city next Thursday night here to the planning board and the planning board is expected to uh, consider and then adopt that plan. Uh, what happens after that is that we'll present it to the city council, again the entire city will present to the council in January. They will hold a public hearing for community feedback in February and we expect them to adopt the plan in March. Remember that the plan is really part of the master plan that the planning board um, works through. The first year of that gets considered by the city council as a part of the city's budget. Um, so we'll be back to having that conversation when the city contemplates its budget in May and June. So, so the CIP, in case anybody asks, that's uh, that's happening. Any, were there any questions I'd about like the campus? I'd like to thank you for the notes that you did that really brought us attention to why it's... Why it's there? Why, it's, why it is what it is. I told you I started doing that in Hampton because I had a board member who asked me every month the same question. I finally said, Jerry, I gotta <laughs> shout out to Jerry. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry, I'm gonna put the note right here to remind you and me Jerry. what it was that we said that Jerry, reason was. Jerry legacy report. <laughs> Jerry's legacy. So oh, I no, I, I like the notes too because it helps helps all of us keep track of the things that we've already discussed before. Margo. I have a ran well, I think it's related. This came up in the sustainability committee meeting. So confusion over the pavement, right? We we don't own our buildings, so the CIP for paving goes into the school CIP plan, but the, the reason why it came up in sustainability is most of the districts around us are looking at when they redo their parking lots, putting solar rays in as both a means of generating sustainable energy, shading vehicles that are there, and the question because there are city councilors on that and school board, and no one knew the answer of <laughs> who proposes that and pays for that. And in, in fact, there was confusion as to why the paving went through the school department. So I, I'm just curious if you know a short answer to that. Well, I mean, yeah, the quick answer is that everything that we do through the CIP is on the city side. So for instance, although Kenny and I get involved, and Kenny frequently spearheads and leads the capital project. The funding, like we don't pay the bills, the funding actually goes through city finance and those dollars are all part of, when we borrow the bonding and the borrowing, it's, it's all approved by the city council. It's really all on the city side of the, of the ledger, if you will. We just get involved because <coughs> they're our schools. Right. Um, and so I guess I, <clears throat> I, I guess I would have to say, if for instance, uh, instead of doing, um, you said paving, roofing? Right. I mean, I'm talking about paving because the solar rays in the parking lots where the cars park under them. You know, it's like the so, so in Oyster River, we, in Oyster River, when they did the middle school, they put a, a canopy up over staff parking. Yeah. And there's enough, uh, enough solar being generated there to significantly offset the cost of the um, uh, geothermal pumps that they put in the ground to heat and cool that building. The solar is powering the pumps so that it's pretty close to an off-the-grid solution, as I've, right. I've toured it multiple times and love that building. If we were going to do something like that, yeah, I think, to be fair, that would that's a conversation Kenny and I, the superintendent, the school department would have to say, hey, when we put, you know, when we put a new roof up or when we pave, we don't just want to pave, we want to put canopies up or we want to, we'd have to, I think we'd have to lead that. Uh, I mean, certainly if the city came around and said, we want to put solar panels, uh, solar array on, on one of the buildings, 
the city might lead that conversation. That might come out of DPW or the sustainability side of the house, the planning and sustainability, um, and we'd be a party to that because it's our building. But, um, but, but not no, likely. Most but, of that would we generate it. Yeah, we, it would have us. to come from us because I don't okay. think anybody generally they're not looking to. Other departments got their own responsibilities. And they're so busy, they they're don't so want busy. to mess with us. We've got our responsibility, oh, yeah, and yeah. so yeah, if we yeah. wanted to do something yeah. like that, that's something. That's something that we'd have to launch through this through this capital initiative when we do it. And paving is the summer, correct? Um, paving is school. paving is uh, in the next three or four summers because first we have to assess um, where pedestrians should go. There's not a we don't we don't manage pedestrian foot traffic in the parking lots well, so an assessment will consider that as well as um, the. Um, uh, the traffic flow, the traffic pattern in the parking lots and around the building, which might actually reverse, about, is right. one thing that's been discussed. Uh, I'm, not pro I'm not projecting anything. I'm just saying I know that that was at least one of the questions. <laughs> so we need to discuss all of that and then <laughs> break it down and start doing um, measurable and manageable bites each summer, because obviously this, this, the facility can't be shut down while we do. We did that at Dondero. We dug the whole place up. We laid the whole place down, and for a period of time, you couldn't get in there. Can't really do that in the summer to Portsmouth High School and the pool, et cetera. So we, uh, we intend, plus it's just huge, so we intend to break that up in multiple years. Gotcha. So okay. I will, as a shout out, as you look at the financial report, if you happen to still be looking at it, and if you go to page three and you come down, there are two things that are worth talking about. Cost center 188, maintenance. These are not salaries, because in your financial report, all the salaries are up on page one. This is the, the discretionary, the operating budget, we call it. And in maintenance, Kenny has accounts, and you've seen that in years past, and you'll see it again in this next cycle. Kenny has accounts for each of our buildings, and buried within that, there's an allowance for what he expects for routine maintenance and, um, and unexpected necessary maintenance. The boiler plant you know, for heating, plumbing, electric, elevators, because we have to have annual inspections. Sometimes we have to do maintenance. Um, uh, you, I mean, there's just there's there's 12, 14, 15, 16, 18 categories in every one of the buildings. So to the question of how do we deal with this water con concern and the lead and maybe changing out fixtures, Kenny has to use those dollars that he has, some of which are itemized specifically for I have a contract with a company who comes in and evaluates the elevators twice a year, and they cost this much each time they come. But then he's also got some contingency dollars, which is for once in a while I need an elevator, that, I mean well, I've got an elevator that needs some upgrade to the, the mechanical side, to the engine or the, the, the motor. Uh, and so those dollars are there. That's where he'll have to put that. Those costs related to dealing with lead. Two lines down, 190, there's a line that has no money in it, which is something Kenny has asked a couple of times for us to contemplate starting to put some dollars in so that smaller <laughs> projects that happen like <coughs> ripping up and replacing the carpet, uh, which is not a hundred thousand dollar capital project if you're doing it in the library of one of the buildings but it might be a twenty five or thirty thousand dollar project and he'd like to be able to call those out budget for them and then tackle them on an annual basis and years back he had money for those kinds of projects didn't have to eat it or bury it in his maintenance um, his routine maintenance uh, and so we'll talk about that when we get to budget but that was in answer to the question about That's where are we going to where are we going to find that for Kenny and what it means is if he if it's a lot if it's more than we'd expected then he'll do, he'll be less likely to take on a painting project or a flooring project. He'll make it wait another year because he used more money on f f fixtures for water than he expected. So, thank you. Nathan. Yeah, I just have one quick thing. You mentioned CTE and like a 25 year, what was it, revaluation. Could you just go over that again? Because I didn't yeah. really catch it. So, the career, and tech, the career and tech centers, there's multiple of them around the, around the state, and the state essentially has a, uh, a, a tradition, if you will, of funding major capital renovation at the CTE centers. And the, the timeline ends up being about every 25 years, the state funds a major portion of a renovation and expansion or uh, you know, a re-envisioning re of the career and tech centers. And our turn at uh, Portsmouth is coming up in 30-31. And the funding coming out of the state capital budget can sometimes get cantankerous because it's the same budget that pays for the roads, the highways, the bridges all over the state. But our funding would come up in 30-31, and they might pay up to 70% of a project. So in the CIP right now, we've contemplated the possibility of doing a $10 million project, $3 million of it locally, 
raised and seven million coming from the state. Um, but, but the timing of that would also be a great opportunity for us to tackle some other things happening in that building because once we have a contractor on site and we're ripping the ceilings open and such, things like dealing with the air in the, in the language lab, upstairs on the second that language wing, not lab wing, we, would, we plan to deal with that at the same time that we're doing the CTE work. Thank you. We renovated the high school before CTE was at the same time. It was at the same time, and we yeah. did it, yeah, back in, in uh, 2002, 3, 4. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, I have a question. How did the meeting go about the sound barriers for New Franklin? So, I'm not the. I don't know if I should answer. I wasn't here. I read the article. Oh. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I, I had missed the scheduling of it, and I walked. I walked by, and I said, "Oh, there's a meeting." Shh tiptoed by and out the door I went at 7 o'clock, whatever. And I, I, um, and I should have come in and sat down because the DOT was in here and they were talking about it. I think, unfortunately, the news that I read or that I remember was there are some sound, some significant sound barriers coming for neighborhoods that are not New Franklin Elementary School. Yeah. Um, and so there, there is a, a privacy fence that has been envisioned, um, but that won't, that won't have an impact against sound. Um, so, so that's not part of the CIP. That's not part of our. It's, part of it's not CIP. part of our CIP right now. There continues to be a conversation about if we wanted to fund something ourselves as a city, uh, where could it be located? Uh, and there was a comment I had at a meeting. Now I'm completely off the off the rails because at I'd, the bottom of the bird. I was at a meeting and there was a conversation about the. In order to have an impact, it would have to be. Thirty feet. Thirty feet tall. Thirty, 30 foot tall meeting. sound It'd have to be a thirty foot tall sound barrier, and 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 there's a, a concern that it would have to be on New Franklin. Right. We can't do it on state. We, we can't do it on the state's property. We'd have to put it on ours. Which, right. anyway, um, and 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 it would have to extend because if it doesn't extend far enough, right. then the sound just comes around it. It was. It's. Yeah, it sounded really to me in all of the conversations that I've had. It sounds so very primitive. This technology, this science, mm -hmm. and maybe it is it's simply erecting a big barrier so that you don't you're not hearing the sound. The wave sound waves aren't coming through, but it sounds like you have to you have to go the whole nine yards and then some to really have an impact. And yeah, it's okay. it's not in the cards right now from the state's perspective. And I don't know that we have any other good answers. We have an locally. engineering solution that yeah. doesn't involve the state. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions AC for helps. Nathan? Zach. I was going to mention one other thing in, in Nathan's realm. So you, we also gave you the just a reminder on budget meeting dates and times uh, that uh, now these uh, I think Paula indicated any you know there, some of the locations could be flexible depending on some other meetings that might be uh, that might be scheduled. So just a heads up on that. I also want to let you know just in terms of our thought process some of the, some of the stuff we're already working on. In terms of some of those budget work sessions where we looked at we looked at particular items, based on previous conversations we've had, I've got right now uh, Rick Maddy, the director of people support, is working on doing a, a fuller explanation of the process by which students go into out of district placements. Uh, what does that process look like? How do they go out? Um, what are the costs associated with it? What it, what is the process by which we would consider bringing students who are in out of district placements? back in um, and uh, so Rick's working on putting together something that would probably work right now in our minds we're thinking the 16th would probably be when that would happen the other one that we've been been working on not not intensely working on but are anticipating that we will do is um, doing a session on multiple different ways to think about try to evaluate the equity between schools in terms of budgeting the schools within the district, so that's between elementary schools or comparing the middle school to an elementary or high school, like how, what are some different ways to slice the information in order to think about the extent to which we're fairly distributing funds between buildings and, um, and give you a bunch of different ways to think about that um, and to inform kind of, you know, kind of all your overall approach. We don't have something right now that we're thinking about for the fourth that we already have uh, the fourth session, um, but um, but we're open to the longer in advance you 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 make a request, the better the quality of the information we can bring to you uh, around your request. So, Harry and and Lisa, <laughs> you're always looking this way. So I, well, exactly. I'm, I'm always looking this I'm way. Always, um, I got to get better. <laughs> this whole meeting, I'm not looking this way. I'm doing a bad job. Um, 
the and I'm so sorry I cannot remember the person's name, but the transition there the someone transitioned to a curriculum position across the elementaries. Stacy Weeks Stacey. for math or there was there was Stacy Weeks who was former formerly was exclusively the Vice assistant principal, principal at Little Harbor. It was yes. the only elementary um, assistant principal we have, and then we moved, we changed her role to be across elementaries. Okay. In a curricular role to kind of coordinate curriculum across elementary schools. It, I don't know if you see that as tying into budget in that discussion, but I, that would be something I think could be of interest of what that looks like um, and what, I don't know, the recommendations are to you know it's hard because like the strategic plan will be coming it's definitely going to be part of that too that right. alignment right. but at the same time the budget needs to be done in yep. march and you know so we know it's going to be there but how do we do it thank you lisa um two quick things um when rick maddie is coming in i wonder if we can broaden that just beyond out of district placement i know there's been some questions about that but I'd love in some way to hear more about the para question and sort of like what things we can do for the kids that are in our buildings when we're not able to hire enough paras. And I don't know if there's budget implications for that, but I would just be curious. And then I think that ultimately I'm not sure where you're at with the conversation around world languages but I think if there's any curriculum changes that are being oh that would I think that's a that's a I would session definitely want itself. to have Helene yeah. Wempel who's our department head yeah. be at that hearing and anyone else who you think can speak to it but yeah. definitely to have that perspective thank you Lisa thank you anyone else um, I know we've discussed this in the past, um, and I don't know, it seems like budget season may be the time to, to bring it up again, um, but uh, I've been speaking with some people again about the sort of discrepancy in our funding of athletics versus all the other extracurriculars, mm -hmm. specifically the ones that also compete. Um, and I'd like to, I don't know who the, person, the right people to mm -hmm. talk to about that are, but um, I'd like us to have some time to discuss that a little bit. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, let's move on. Next on the agenda is um, a student representative report. Nathan? Uh. Uh, so just before I start, sorry everyone, I um, last Tuesday or Wednesday when I was emailing with Paulette, I didn't have all the info uh, to write everything down, so right now when you go onto the agenda, it's just a blank brief outline, so I, I do apologize, but in the future you should have a full and detailed one um, ready when I start. Uh, so to start, I'll talk about Little Harbor. Uh, so with my communication with Mrs. Lawson, I was able to learn that Little Harbor's Best Buddies chapter has been chosen for an outstanding chapter award by the Best Buddies program. Um, this group is, this is a group of students in grades one through five focused on fostering friendship through shared experiences and interests between students in, with and without disabilities. Um, and the Best Buddies program has impacted over 1,200,000 people across the world. Um, so we should all be very proud of the work that those students have done. Uh, also, the fifth grade class has re recently read a book, The Long Walk to Water. Um, that inspired them to raise money to help provide clean drinking water to the people of South Sudan. Um, and after soliciting donations for the Iron Giraffe Challenge, they were able to raise over $1,000 towards the cause, um, and that qualified themselves to receive, receive many um, prizes, but as well as get a visit from Salva Dut, who's the character in the book. Okay. Um, they also got a poster to hang up in the school. Um, moving on to the middle school, uh, there was a band and choir combined concert that had a full house, the students said. Um, it was one of the most full concerts that they've had since before COVID, so that's great to hear. Um, and also, with, along with the concert, PMS band students accompanied the high school band at the holiday tree lighting to help them play holiday carols. Uh, so when I asked the middle school students what 
could be going better at the school. Let's just say they had a lot to say. <laughs> um, but the first big thing that they mentioned was scheduling. So their core class is like an advisory, um, and they travel with that same group for the whole day. So they don't really see anyone else. Um, so they, uh, they do want a, a change there. Um, they also said that they want their, at least their eighth grade year, be more like high school. Um, if that entail jumping straight into classes at the beginning of the day or switching student groups throughout the day, like for each class, um, that was definitely a uniform request by all of them. Um, also, their success block, so which is exactly like flex in the high school, um, they're saying isn't beneficial, and that's also a reoccurring theme of what I'm hearing in the high school as well. Uh, so it's the last period in the day, kids are checked out, they're just not focused. Um, and for many of them, they need to be finishing homework, talking to the teacher, and they're just not tuned in at that point in the day. So that's just something to think about. Um, and lastly, their cell phone policy in the middle school um, forces all students to put their phones away in their lockers before the day starts. That's what the students told me. Um, and no matter what grade you, and you're, you aren't allowed to use your phone during any point of the day, which I believe includes lunch as well from what they told me. Uh, so they said that they really want this to be uh, edited, changed, so that's just another thing to think about. Moving on to the high school, um, a, lot, a lot of sports stuff. So to start off, the football team had an undefeated regular season, earning themselves a bye and going straight to the quarterfinals. Um, after defeating National North in the quarters, the team went on to play in the NHIAA Division I state semifinals, um, where unfortunately they lost to Bedford. Although the game didn't go the way that they hoped, uh, we should all give the team and the 23 seniors on that team um, wow. <laughs> a, a lot of credit wow. for the work that they put in. Uh, so next is the women's soccer team. Um, as I hope you all know, our varsity team went on to go all the way to the Division I state finals, um, where they lost to Bedford, uh, not Bedford, um, Timberlane, one nothing. Uh, as someone who was at the game, and I, I saw many of you guys there as well, um, it, was, it was a really good game, and it was amazing to watch all of them compete. Um, and very big shout outs to Sylvie Gorchino to being named NH All-State first team defender, as well as Annie Parker for making attacker in the NH All-State second team, and Ailish Honda for receiving an honorable mention. Uh, the volleyball team, so after uh, finishing the regular season with flying colors um, and winning an exciting game against Wyndham in the quarterfinals, the girls went on to the NHIA Division I semifinals where they played Hollis Brookline. Unfortunately, they couldn't pull off a win, but the two senior captains, Georgia Pinicaro and Margaret Montplaisier, both represented Portsmouth uh, in the 2023 D1 All-Star Games. Uh, men's soccer, the boys' varsity team finished with a 7-6 and six record and made it into the Division I playoffs, where they played Bedford in the opening round. Um, although, although the game did misrepresent the hard work and effort the boys had put into the season, we're proud of what they accomplished um, and looking forward to the next. Uh, the field hockey team had a very impressive regular season, and the girls made it all, all the way to the Division II state quarterfinals. Um, but they lost to bed, uh, the number one seed, John Stark. Uh, and although it didn't end the way they wanted to, it was a great game. The girls should be proud. And a huge shout out to the Division II All State girls from Portsmouth, being Shiloh Winstein, Erie Winstein, Sydney Moreau, and Maggie Conklin. Uh, there's the PHS golf team. Uh, the team had a very good season, and after placing second in the state in Division II, they went on to send four of their top scorers to the individual state championship. Here, Shea, Har Shea Harrison, Gray Gagnon, Turner LaDuke, and Briggs Williams all competed, and Shea Harrison placed third in the state, and Gray Gagnon placed fourth. Wow. Uh, and last but not least, the cross-country team. Uh, after a uh, great fall season. Nolan Peters, Ollie Fitzpatrick, Theo B, William Hart, Wild Kerrigan, Nico Rinaldi, and Logan Chassis were all athletes that uh, competed in the statewide tournament. When I was going through this, I was like, this is a lot of sports. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the arts at the high school, um, the PHS marching band season has, had come to a close later than usual this year thanks to our uh, winning football team. Uh, and the halftime show this season consisted of an arrangement of songs from the Beatles. Uh, during this time, the band performed on, at multiple venues across Portsmouth for our Veterans Day and holiday themed services. And along with the marching band season, the band's upcoming holiday program will be a makeup of holiday classics and Christmas carols, and a few of them similar to the ones at the uh, holiday tree lighting. Uh, the PHS Choir has been preparing for their holiday concert next week and also has spent time caroling around Portsmouth. They've also traveled to a Seacoast Choral Festival where they performed amongst choir, other choirs around the Seacoast. And they're also preparing for their holiday concert partnering with the Portsmouth Symphony Orchestra, which is this week, I think, I hope. <laughs> this um, week. Yeah, this week. Uh, and as I hope you all know, the theater program just wrapped up their show, The Wedding Singer. Um, it was amazing, it, really good show. 
Um, and I heard that there were great turnouts for all nights and days of the showings. And while everyone in the show is amazing, I would like to give credit to the lead roles, um, Max Kavanaugh, Charlotte McVay, Shay O'Keefe, Ranger LaDuce, Zuri Wemple, and Hugh Gatchel for their amazing performances. Um, and here's just a few ac academic and extracurricular ach achievements. Um, the PHS math team placed first in a small school division as well as first place overall for 10 teams. Uh, the top scorers were Adam Hoskin, Charlie Anderson, John Tobin, Daniel Sabalakov, Timmy Tran, Seth Kozak, John Hoyam, Marlon Pinto, and Kurthy Su Supermanian. Uh, the debate team has competed in many competitions around the state in which they won first, second, and third place in the team rounds as well as receiving first, second, and third place in the speaker rounds. Some of the debates included climate issues, present politics, and many other eye-opening issues and subjects. The Portsmouth Model UN has attended two conferences at PEA and St. John's, uh, and they have represented various countries and discussed many different topics, and Miles Bourne and Sophie Williams received honorable mentions as best, best delegates for their strong efforts. And we had two Portsmouth students accepted into the NH All-State Band, those being Zoe, Gagne, Zoe, Zoe Gowan and Seth Berg. Uh, Zoe made first chair bass clarinet and Seth made third chair clarinet, so congratulations to them both. And just uh, a visit that PHS recently welcomed Jared Krasowska to give his lecture on his past experiences and present books. And he also gave two workshops, one for writing and one for drawing and comic creation. Uh, as someone who attended the writer's workshop, I can say that Mr. Krasowska did a fantastic job while he was there. Um, and we wish him luck with his new novels. Um, just a few things with Student Senate. Um, so Spirit Week was stated by faculty as one of the most cleanly run and smooth Spirit Weeks in a while, which is great to hear. Um, the Student Senate and Spirit Week Committee was responsible for all of the planning and execution of the Spirit Week. Um, and that includes the pep rally, the homecoming dance, and the actual week itself. So kudos to everyone that was involved. Um, and many topics that were discussed at these meetings are also included in Mr. Kenosi's principal report, which I'm just about to go through. So when I met with Mr. Kenosi, he just gave me um, this document that he's created. I imagine you've probably seen it, but I'm just going to go over a few things. So the Academic Standards, Co uh, Standards Council, so PHS launched a ASC last year to, to create an advisory team of students, faculty, and administrators to discuss and debate new course proposals. This year, the ASC will continue its curriculum review and will engage the faculty in other issues around cu curricular and instructional design. As well, as well as assessment strategies and other critical elements that support and encourage best practices to maximize learning. Uh, as mentioned quite a few times already today and last night actually, um, curriculum mapping, so PHS is well underway in our comprehensive mapping of the scope and sequence of all courses currently offered in the, and in the works to be offered in the short term. This work is led by our Office of Curriculum and Instruction at the, uh, and the faculty. This is an important and essential step in ensuring that our students and faculty have a cohesive and clear trajectory of learning opportunities over the, the entire four years of PHS. Um, and lastly, the Global Connect program. Uh, so PHS is proud to announce the launch of the Global Connect program. Global Connect is a global citizen scholar experience that spans four years that emphasizes a deep engagement with world languages, service learning, immersive travel experiences, and, academic, and an academic approach to globally focused thinking. Um, as someone who is a part of this program, I can't emphasize enough um, that this program is one of the most interesting, eye-opening, eye immersive, and globally connected projects that I've ever been a part of. So I'm very excited to see what that entails in the future. But that's it. Awesome. That's great. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Are there any questions for Nathan? Good job. Yes, yeah. Marco. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would just say I think this format's great. Thank you for bringing it to the board. It's really informative. I love. It's super important to the board to hear the student voice, and I'd, I'd love, of course, I, I thought it was all very positive, and I'd like to s land on the data about flex block and success block, and I wonder if there's the space there to form some sort of a focus group on what are the needs of it, right? The intention is it's a space for kids to get help and do work and, and stay organized, so that's the need. And then the question becomes, why is it not meeting that need? Is it simply they're burnt out last period? Is it half of them have to go to extracurriculars or, or something? Like, and how do, we, how do we fit that need? Like, I would love to get a group of students together because, you know, a couple of years ago, FlexBlock, as you remember, was in the middle of the day. And when we first moved Flex to the end, the receipt was, this is much better. Yeah. And it was the same thing with success. I've seen that ebb and flow. So I'm always curious 
why the change? What's the shift, and how do we how do we pivot? So maybe that's something that you could organize the middle schoolers to gather some data, and we can gather some data on the high school and and consider what to do with that. Yeah. But thank you. It was really awesome. Yes, Danielle, and then Kerry. If I can just put a plug in to wrap Lister into that conversation as well, because we also have a support block um, that we are constantly in conversations about how to best use it in regards to that extra smaller one-to-one -one or small group learning versus the yes emotional social emotional learning that has to happen versus executive functioning skills that have to happen versus reward for being successful versus relationship building between oh students gosh. and staff and so all of those things happen and I know the middle school is dealing with that I know the high school is seeking s the same intense um, and so if we can all sort of join forces and actually I know the elementary schools are too I know in that you know we talk we've had presentations from those morning blocks of how to start that day off how to get those things out of such limited time okay. yeah That's great Thank you, Danielle. Carrie. This is great. I have, like, I really appreciated it, and it made, we get updates on certain things, but I've never heard so many pieces and things all together. Um, so I just wanted to thank you. I worry about the workload on you that this creates. It took a little bit, but it, it but really wasn't that I'm bad. sure you're, you'll automate things or figure, but thank you for this and putting it all together. It also Lisa. came up at the end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, two quick things just in terms of the workload. You know, all of our elementary schools and the middle school, they'd have newsletters like the high school does, and you might be able to get some of that information you're looking for from those. So you don't have to try to call. All yeah, that's what I, that's Mrs. Day. Lawson actually told me that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, I should probably. And then if you are having a conversation about flex or success block, I'd also be curious about sort of what's the student perspective based on whether or not they actually need support during that time. Because I've heard both opinions of it. Like I know for some kids, like that's when they have a chance to actually go through their planner or get the extra help from teachers that they need to go home and finish their homework versus kids who already know what they need to do and are just like, why am I being forced to sit in this room? <laughs> so I would just be curious to, to think about all of the pieces of it. Um, I want to echo what everyone else has said about how, how appreciative I am of this information because it's really, it is different to hear it from the inside than it is to um, yes. just read about it or, or hear it through uh, word of mouth. But um, I also wondered if you have a contact at Robert Lister and if you've included, if that was included in the high school bit or not. And if not, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe you can find somebody to connect with there to include that next time too. Yeah, definitely my next report I'll be um, communicating with Robert J. Lister Academy as well. So, awesome. And I, I, I just you. literally when Carrie said that I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much. It's so much. This is so much this time already. Yeah, that's This great. is fantastic. Thank you, Pip. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Um, we're going to do this once a month, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we'll see you at the, not the first meeting in January, the second meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next we have Margo with her oh. final policy <laughs> committee report. <laughs> Buckle up, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're just cleaning your desk off, huh? Yeah, just <laughs> mild dusting. Um, <laughs> So uh, apologies, we had two sessions of the policy committee this month, so because that's not our norm, one of the sets of minutes we absentmindedly left out of the packet, not intentionally. So you have a copy of the minutes from the meeting on the 29th at your desk, and then obviously you have a copy of the minutes from the meeting on the 6th in the packet. So as we've been saying for the last month, get ready, the, the policy committee was reviewing our policies in an effort to seek, overlap with our same goals of communication that we have and bring that into the policies of how can they be clear, how can they be consistent, how can they be um, um, aligned with New Hampshire state law, et cetera. So not to say that they aren't, but just 
what's the best way? Um, and so that involved several different things. One was we identified all of the policies that are unique only to Portsmouth, no other school district but ours has it, or what the New Hampshire School Board Association would say are optional policies. So there's required, state law required, there's recommended, and then there's optional. And we generated a list of those policies. And then we also decided, since the board has gone through a long process of writing the rules and orders of the board, it was the appropriate time to take a look at section B of the policy book, which are the policies pertaining to the board. And so in front of you, you have two sets of tasks that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, in the process of looking at those, some policies came up with a need for edit, um, and other policies came up with a need for elimination. So I will um, address the um, first readings first. Bless you. God bless you. Um, so I, I, I would love to take a motion to approve the rules and orders of the board, which is coded as B, and then we can have a discussion to follow. Move. Anne, a second? Second. Great, Carrie. So as you see in the minutes, since we created the rules and orders, and those stand as the way in which the board will be governed and operated, we needed to refer to those because then it became important to not have redundancy. So the rules and orders stand here. You would not want a place where you have the same information twice because if they're not exactly lockstep, that's problematic. And so any policy that was stated in the rules and order, we no longer needed, um, we would no longer need a policy for. So section B just, that policy B just states these rules and orders will be created and they will exist publicly for all to see. Mm -hmm. So that is a brand new policy up for first reading. Any discussion? Carrie. So um, I tried to get caught up for the stuff that I missed, which was a tran I can't even think of the word, <laughs> tangentially uh, related to this. Mm -hmm. And so based on those conversations, these just seem to complement that conversation. Is there any change that you would highlight from those conversations to these? To policy B or? Um, I'm sorry, yeah, I was more collectively, like the, are, we, are you just on that B, I'm the first just one? on the first reading, so can't take them as a group. So um, this is oh, brand new, okay. so B, sorry. B, B is brand new. Yeah, never and mind. It refers Let, to them. Then I will my. But I will incorporate that into the presentations of the next ones if it helps. Okay. Um, any other discussion on B? Great. Um, so let's take a. Uh, we don't need roll call because no one's online. Right? right. Correct. Great. So all those in favor of first read for policy B? Anybody opposed? Great. So that motion passes. Okay. So the second. One is coded BBAA. You'll see this looks like a lot of crossouts. That's because our previous BBAA was called individual members. New Hampshire School Boards Association BBAA is school board member authority. Um, and in reading through that policy and what's stated in our rules and orders, one, we want to be, comp we, we would like to code lockstep with New Hampshire School Board Association, so we're working <coughs> to move towards that. And so what you're seeing in front of you is the sample <coughs> New Hampshire School Boards Association BBAA to replace the previous BBAA that we had, which was different language. As you see, the cross out was what our previous BBAA was, and we felt as though this overarching was a better definition of the responsibilities of the board. So, Motion. So, Second. <laughs> great. Carrie and Pip, yeah. any discussion? I also I wanted to respond to Carrie's question yeah. because I think I, I, if I understand what you're asking, it is were there any um, content changes between what's been changed or what's being proposed in the policy and the rules? Is that what you mean? It's, because we're trying to sort of level out the two so that some of the content exists in the policy and, and most of it exists in the rules. But that they don't, bo they don't. Nothing exists in both places because that's where we felt like it could get dangerous yep. if we didn't know which we were referring to. 
So mm -hmm. I think if that's your question, the answer is no, nothing content-wise has changed. We've just made sure everything exists in one of the two places. And, and mine, what I was looking at the whole of them. Yeah. Um, and so like I, one specific example, when we get to the school board meetings piece is like that attendance and that, that whole thing, like that wasn't in my recollection in those other meetings. And so like, yep. the, but that's when I thought we we're talking about the whole, so I'm all, yep. okay. I'm all good, but okay. there's I, just a preview of my question. Gosh. I will say Margo though, your the meeting notes or the minutes and the notes are very clear Great. on like what the recommendation was. Um, and so if you want to minimize your conversation about it, Great. they were, I don't mean Perfect. To. That's awesome. <laughs> Lisa, thank you. Perry set me right up. Um, <laughs> I have a question in this section that's from line 20 to 22. Um, just about whether we would want to have board members who are on these committees provide minutes back to the board because some of the committees don't always provide detailed minutes. And just in terms of maybe limiting our time with information items, you know, for example, if there was just like a report from the futures committee in the packet, and then if you have a question, you could ask. And that just might, and I'm not saying we maybe, I don't know if we have to amend that or put that in the policy, but it was just a question. And then we're also saying that committee assignments would be made by the chairperson and have board approval. So that seems a little different than how we've been doing it. I mean, I, I like that idea in theory. I just was wondering if we had intended to change that. It's funny. We've we've done it that way, just not with a formal vote. We've, we've handed oh, okay. out the new committee assignments and said, here are the new committee <laughs> yeah, assignments, yeah. and everybody <laughs> says, okay. so, okay. um, and sense. then to your point, we've discussed that a lot in our planning sessions, and it's definitely in the direction we want to move. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the policy committee is really trying to avoid procedure in policies and so so there are some committees that board members are on that they write their own minutes which can be directed to the board but what you're saying is if you're the rep on a committee you would instead of a committee report verbally in the committee report update section on the agenda there could be a link to minutes is yeah. that correct I think or That's, a link to minutes or if there's not formal minutes just a few bullet points right you know like we talked about we raised you know five thousand dollars for scholarships that you know will be awarded in June done you know like or <coughs> just thinking about ways to sort of just streamline the discussion and also just have some accountability for people who are serving in those roles yep so it also sort of goes into the attendance question that we have in another in another so that's definitely it's at first reading so that's definitely we could send back to the policy committee that at line 22 we add something about um, written updates brief written updates I uh, um, can be provided. I don't know how the. I'm trying to find the rules. I felt like we had some. We had it, but it, we went on. No, we rules. talked about it being within 72 hours of okay. the board committees, but not on the committees. Okay. So it's in there. I don't have my rules with me. I, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm working through it. need to make right it like super burdensome. Like, I don't think we need to write like eight page memo. No, but I think it's. <laughs> Go ahead. One, sorry, one thought on that was just that I, I like that idea. Um, I think maybe that way that keeps the announce, like announcements or events or things like, hey, this is coming up, but also just not doing that every meeting. And so we had talked about having standard operational calendar and doing like committee report updates quarterly or, you know, something like that, just so that it's not about every meeting. It's just a general summary. But... Yep. Um, it is in Rule 19 where it says, um, shall take minutes for each meeting held and shall make the minutes available to the public within 72 hours. The minutes shall be presented to the full board as a written report for informational purposes. Standing committees and ad hoc subcommittees of the board shall establish meeting dates and times. So um, there was a conversation about like how do I report back from recreation? How do I report that's back from what I'm talking right? About. That's yeah. what you're or like talking about. Or <coughs> the library or yep. So, <laughs> so we can um, we can take a vote on this with the recommendation for the policy committee to consider adding something after line 22. Any other discussion on BBAA? 
So would you like to make an amendment or would we like to We'd make like the recommendation? We'd like to trust our policy committee to add what may be three words to this, like in whatever way they think is best. Yep. <laughs> so all those in favor of first reading with policy committee uh, considering the discussion, uh, say aye or yep. Great. Anybody opposed? Okay, board officers, that's just updating it. it. The old one had secretary in there. To my knowledge, we haven't had that in a long time. We also felt very strongly that the non-voting members, our teacher um, rep and our student rep needed to be mentioned because those are members of our board, which was not previously mentioned in the last um, policy. So the last, in our last board packet, policies, which you'll see under elimination, we had one for vice chair, one for chair, one for secretary, um, and that was not necessary. We can combine them all into one under board officer, so that's what you're seeing there. Got it. Uh, I'll take a motion. It would be nice if we could get SAU 50 to come to our meetings. We'll have to work on that. It's a good yeah. area meeting next conversation. Next yep, yeah. or just general yeah. outreach to Steve. Move to approve. Great. Second. Perfect. Any oh. discussion? All those in favor. All those in favor? Very Any opposed? <laughs> Great. Continuing on. Advisory committees to the board. That previously for us was air, it specifically only spelled out the area advisory committee that we had versus the New Hampshire School Board Association sample policy opens it up to a wider lens of there may be circumstances where you might want these special advisory committees. And we felt as though that was more in line with the intent of the policy. Also, SEU 50 didn't have the area advisory and they're who we have it with under their policies. So that was another reason why we felt as though we wanted to model the um, sample policy instead of our one specific policy to be a little bit more wider. So I would love to take a motion on that. Anybody motion to? Motion. Great, no. Nancy and Lisa. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Great, that one passes. Um, school board meeting. So, um, so Carrie, the, the, this one, as Pip eloquently stated, we want to make sure that there are things that live in rules and orders, and there are things that properly live in policy. And um, rules and orders included everything that's scratched out in red, but it had nothing about the attendance and um, mm -hmm. online online participation. And that that's that's important and, and necessary to the role of the board. So. Um, that was the change, and it wasn't coded properly. Ours was BE, and it's BEA with the New Hampshire School Board Association. So happy to take a motion to approve BEA school board meetings for first reading. Anne, second. Carrie, Carrie. any discussion? Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this the for that the absences and things like that? Um, I guess so it's it's just interesting for me to think about the perspective of like mental health or illness or and so in one spot we have that the reason for absences will be made public and then if three meetings are missed it's really about the reasons and then like I so I assume that that would be I, I don't know I'm just trying to put out there like if someone is in rehab from substance use or struggling with mental health like there's just a lot of is the reasons the what we want is kind of my question on that great question so I will say we've dealt with this the the reasons don't go public to the board it's okay. just a notification to the chair since you are an elected person you fill a seat of which votes take place so it's just a notice to the chair and most of the time we're well aware of the reason okay. why. Um, okay, gotcha. On the times when not aware or it's a, you know, that's a different conversation, but not a public acknowledgement of absences. Okay. Did, did that answer it? Um, yeah, that, so that answered the 30% the part. Okay. Um, it, maybe the part 
uh, line 18, the reason for participation from a remote location shall be stated in the minutes of the meeting. Um, that's where I see like, that's the state. Isn't that a statutory? Well, it's a state statutory. That's a statutory. Okay. I think. So um, only for remote participation. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. You. Yes. And I think that can be above. I don't think yeah. that has to be in the weeds. So we can just make sure people know it's not yep. like a. Yeah. You don't need to share about. No. Whatever you don't want to share about. Right. There's right. Some, yeah. Fair. Family reasons or personal, like you know, yeah. travel. It doesn't. I'm away. I mean, isn't, yeah. isn't right. some I'm of away. it like I need an absentee ballot because I won't be there? I, mean, I think it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the just the language reads harsher than the practice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. And that's state would, language yeah. that's required for that one. Got it. Thank you, Lisa. Agree with Carrie, and in that same section we were talking about um, missing three consecutive meetings or more than 30% of scheduled meetings. Yep. Um, with that 30%, I wonder what the time horizon is on that. Because like 30% in perpetuity, right. I'm yeah. never hitting it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so that's I just great. think for clearness, we should say what we mean in terms of is that in a year or what did we mean? Yeah. I don't know what should the answer is, but. Consecutive meetings? It needs to mean it, something it or it means nothing. It needs to mean something. Um, <laughs> So I think it's three, I think it should say three consecutive meetings or more than 30% of scheduled meetings in a year. Yeah. Because that's I essentially the that. same I thing. I think a year sounds okay. Um, I just think we need to say what we yep. need. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So. It, I mean, one other thing I just mentioned, it doesn't really say, which is uh, line 30. The board should take action that is appropriate. Such action is appropriate. Yeah. Not a lot of options really no. for boards. Um, no. You know, you, if someone's an elected official, you can censure, um, you can, but you cannot, it's very, you know, there's not really a provision, as far as I know, within New Hampshire state law that would allow you to, like, remove someone from office based on a lack of attendance. So, right. But I'm just saying there's not a lot of action. Right. Yeah. No. Other than, yeah. What if a board member committed a crime? Would that be action? Yeah. I think yeah. even then, to step down, you can't. Even I, I, I don't right, Nathan, right? I mean, even, I, even I, the I, crime. You're, I think you, I think you could hold C and be remoting in remote from, from <laughs> remote from <laughs> wow. county or whatever. I don't. Uh, I, so. I've never had to test that, but I don't think. It, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that that's a bars you from. I don't think there's anything office. in law you could do. Oh my gosh, Lisa. One more thing about sorry. But for your die. <laughs> But we could, I mean, within this, like if there was a committee assignment, we do have the ability to change those assignments. Yes. That yeah. seems fair. We can't fair. take somebody who's been elected yeah. and remove them, but we right. can have yeah. committee assignments change. Yeah. But we could ask someone to recuse themselves if we had an agenda item that was pending on a previous discussion for which they had been absent for. That is an, you could say, mm -hmm. You, you have to recuse yourself from the conversation. That that's an action, not not a very strong one, but I guess yeah, Carrie. Yeah, I would just I agree with the scheduled meetings of per year, thirty percent per year, okay. or in whatever you want to yeah. um, annually to date or something. Um, I, I just wonder about taking out that the board may take such action that is appropriate because I think the other components of those options of censure requesting abstention or you know what I mean like those don't live in here um so just eliminate it just the seems sentence. like a yeah it just seems a little like a empty threat empty threat yeah <laughs> that's fair we're taking out that so scratch scratch 30 30 essentially other comments or are we ready for a vote <clears throat> All those in favor of first read incorporating the changes we've discussed, please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, all those opposed? Great. That one passes. Um, we are up to non-public. That's just a coding. Ours for um, executive. So, and it's as it says in the thing, no need to list a laundry list. Now we'll be just compliant. If RSA changes, our policy changes lockstep with it. Any motion, to, oh, to, motion to approve, Carrie. Second. Second, Lisa. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Policy. First reading passes. And policy um, development adoption review, one small change. 
um, shows as it, I stated in the minutes shown in line 33 we, we we gather our legal data from more than just one source so that keeps it open and it would be the committee and the superintendent that seek that data so we don't need to identify all the sources we seek the data from the rest stands and is lockstep with what we is with our current practice so um, I would love to take a motion to approve BGAA yeah. and great Carry and second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes. And that's it. Nope. Yeah, that's it for the first readings. Um, and now, if you like, we can take the eliminations as a group. Unless um, anyone w wishes to pull any out, I would. My recommendation would be we take the eliminations. As a whole, I'd like to take them as a whole. Great, and Lisa, I'd like to move out BBAR. BBAR. Is that in that group, or am I in the wrong? Yep, section? BBAR. Yeah. Purpose and role of the board. Yes. So hold on. Wrong or, uh, we need. A, we need. A, we could BG. keep it in, but then discuss. Or is there changes? No, I think what you do is you make a motion to accept them all except for yeah. okay. eliminate them all. Okay. So right now, the motion on the floor, which needs a second, is to eliminate uh, to to eliminate the entire group except for B B A R. Unless anyone That's has this. another one. Unless anyone has I, another one. Do you have another one? And I will also second that motion. So I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, you'd like to amend the I'd, current motion on the floor. Okay. I'd like to amend the current motion, motion <laughs> the current motion on the floor, to include BGD. Um, and uh, second. BGD. Okay. Where is that? I will BG read what? BGD uh, n number nine X I okay. uh, t eleven. Sorry. Whew. So just to repeat, the motion on the floor right now is that we would like to take all of the policies, consider all of the policies for elimination as a whole with the exception of three, which is BBAR, and 11, which is BGD. It has a first and a second. So now open it. Do I need a second what Pip said, or is that? Uh, Do you agree? Do I agree to that? Sure. Okay. You agree. It wasn't a friendly. Okay, yeah. Well, I've, I. You have it as a friend. Is anybody is everybody okay with the fact that we've recorded it as Anne made the motion and Pip seconded? Okay. With those two with those two <laughs> backed up. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Great. Any <laughs> discussion on any discussion on the bulk to be eliminated? Let's separate out the two that we've pulled out. So the discussion will be on all but three and eleven. Carrie. Um the um orientation in the that removal mm -hmm. is that in I don't want to lose that word. we want that done mm -hmm. <clears throat> right and have the New Hampshire School Board have new members take that training yep is that just a practice that we do as opposed to a policy yes okay and the practice that was listed in that policy was not the practice we've done okay so it's problematic <laughs> on m multiple Okay. Levels to try to, to your point, trying to remove practice out of policy. Okay. Yep. So good we'll question. Put that on the tentative calendar. Um, yeah. In my head, and then the other one on the organ the reorganization meeting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Is that I assume that's similar? Just that like we don't have it doesn't have to be the first meeting or it doesn't. Yeah, the, exactly. That I mean, it always is the first meeting. The first Tuesday. It just, or, but again. Does the whole district need a policy right. on the board? No. Okay. That's our practice. That's what we do. This is what's elected. The superintendent forms that serves as the chair during that. Okay. But we didn't feel as though policy was necessary for it. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Yep. Any other discussion on that group? Then at this point, I would enthusiastically <laughs> like to take a vote to eliminate. I'm not going to list them all. All that are stated in section C. 
9C with the exception of 3 and 11. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. The motion passes. Now I will take separate motion uh, on I would I will consider whatever motion someone wants to make about BBAR. <coughs> yes, Lisa. So I think I want to just talk for a minute before I make a motion just mm -hmm. to see if people understand or agree. But I can see why some of this wording wouldn't be maybe serving us in the best way or serving the district in the best way, but I feel like conceptually having something in policy that just gives that clear boundary is very valuable for the board, for the superintendent. And so I wonder if this went back as an edit, if it could be considered. And I don't have a firm idea of what it should say, but that would be my thought on that one. Mm -hmm. Like I can see why you wouldn't want the board to sort of just randomly at all times just blow up, <laughs> you know, all of the work that's being done in the district. And at the same time, I can see a rationale for the board having some ability to weigh in in certain situations. And I don't know what that should look like so that it's correct and not destructive. Yep. Follow up on that. Yep. Just like, what would be something you, this would prevent from happening? Just to help me understand. So if you take a very, very long view, there have been in the past certain situations that have come up where I feel like the board felt very strongly that we needed to take sort of some immediate action or have a very urgent conversation about something that was important for safety or was a major shift in curriculum that was kind of coming very quickly without a lot of notice. And a lot of this predates Zach being here, so it's in no way sort of, you know, a criticism as much as to leave some sort of mechanism in place for the conversation and the dialogue, if that makes sense. And I don't want this to be we just come in on a Tuesday and say, hey, Zach, sorry, we don't like what you just spent the last year working on, so we say no. Like, that should not be what this says at all. But it's more just to, like, I like that it lays out sort of where our lines are, but I don't think this is the right way to write it. Does that make, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, Carrie, but. Yeah. I. I think I'm just, I, I think I understand better. I um, I just feel, I, I think probably I would still move it through just because I don't see that this gives any actual authority. <laughs> like I just don't see where you could utilize this to claim, to. In, but that's just my interpretation. But. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think I just, as we were talking about all of our rules and just trying to be really clear about where our lane is, I don't think it's a bad thing to have a policy that sort of, I look at this as sort of like a paving those lanes clearly idea, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I don't have good language. So I don't want to make a motion and just like randomly cram some words into it. But that's just my thought. Pip. Um, I, I find it really interesting that you pulled this one out because I, the one that I wanted to pull out, I had thought of for the very same reasons, and I don't want to combine them right now because that gets confusing, but um, I'm in complete agreement with you that I, th that, uh, and what I noticed about these two policies is that they were both written in the same year and both reaffirmed in the same year, mm -hmm. and that makes clear to me that during those times there were reasons these policies were mm -hmm. necessary, mm -hmm. and while <laughs> I, um, while I don't feel that they're necessary immediately right now, I think that they are valuable um, for exactly the reasons that they were written, because there do need to be clear boundaries and lines and duties. Um, and so for that reason, I would also, I, I would suggest, I don't think we should try to come up with new language right now on the spot, but I think we should recommend that these both go back to policy and <coughs> um, be revisited for the, to figure out what their intention is and then make them clearer to, to address that intention. I'm, I think that sounds like a nice, clear plan and clear definition. 
of the swim lanes is um, important. So I don't believe we need a roll call. We can just make the recommend. Uh, we don't need a vote. We just need to make the recommendation that those two policies be sent back, back to, to the that. committee for consideration. If there's any other discussion on those, we can take that at this time for the policy committee to note those recommendations. But those are good points to clarify. And it is interesting how those two are saying the same but different. Uh, one using the line of educational realm and other using the line of policy realm, of the control of the board. So there might be a place there to find clear definition. May I? Offer? Yeah. Don't the, the policy committee should not forget, at least with regard to the first, that the powers and duties that extend to the school board are established by the city charter and by state law. Right. So part of the reason why you might have initially thought don't need this is because it would be very difficult for the board to in, empower itself with duties that aren't prescribed by either the charter or the state law, yeah. and they're yeah. they're limited in the charter, but they're expansive in law. Yeah. So I. Yeah. And that's, uh, thank you for reminding me, that was the conversation we had is that it was redundant to law. And so why would you have a policy that restated the law that you took under oath when you took the office? That was how BBAR, BBAR came up. And so we will send those back to the policy committee for, con for considera more consideration. That's it from the policy committee, thank you. Thank you, Margo, and mm -hmm. once again, your work on the policy committee has been admirable. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. We're, we're, think... we're going to miss your involvement. Mm -hmm. in that. Well, um, but you'll come back. Volunteer. Someday. Margo, is, Margo back. is determined. <laughs> she'll she'll be back. Margo has been like those, working in a coal mine those, on, uh, like this last home stretch. Three K <laughs> to twelve curriculum <clears throat> integration thing sounds up your alley, Margo. Thank I know. I, I know. You, we'll don't get her back. Don't, don't tease. Don't tease. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all, and thank you to Pip too, who works hard on that committee. Yeah. Um, and Zach, and all that. So, thank you all. Committee <coughs> updates. Do we have any committee updates? Committee yes, I gave Margo. mine for sustainability committee. There's a lot, a lot of conversation in the city right now about solar arrays. It went before the um, uh, zoning. Mm -hmm. I get the, all the boards confused, but um, about solar arrays, and that discussion came up about are we properly using our parking spaces. So I know they're going to put some in the top of the parking garages, and that's what led to the question about the school district. And so now we have that question sitting with us on as we consider parking lots at the schools. The question becomes, is that a, is that a smart place to think about putting solar canopies or solar arrays? <coughs> OK. I, oh, and I forgot, and the high school students presented at that, that they will be starting soon. You've probably already seen it. <coughs> the um, opt-in for when you order takeout, you have to opt-in for your plastic cutlery. So they have worked with all of, so it, now it won't come with your takeout order unless you choose to have it. So they've worked with all of the local restaurants so that you have your own cutlery <coughs> at home and so there's less mm. plastic waste, which is a huge, Big initiative to get a lot of the big restaurants on board with that. If they could just get to Greenland McDonald's so that I don't have to refuse that straw every time. <laughs> I would like a box that says, if it's wooden, I do not want it. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me... Sorry. <laughs> okay, future agenda item. Oh, 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 sorry. It's going to be so fast, Nancy. It's what? It's going to be so fast, though. Okay, take your time. Legislative committee update. Search yes. your inbox. New Hampshire School Board Association emailed everyone their 2024 legislative preview, a recording of the webinar that they did. Watch it. Learn. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. They have already sent the email. It went out today. I saw it. I haven't watched it yet. Okay, it depends <laughs> upon what time of day it went, because I had no email until this afternoon. <laughs> Okay, future agenda requests. If anybody has a request, get it to Marco and me by December 31st. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will reopen the public comment. It looks like there's no one here to um, he talk back to us. Wow. So we will close uh, the reopening of the public comment. 
And um, I just have an, an announcement. The policy committee was scheduled for January 3rd, but we thought we would um, not have it on January 3rd, considering we don't, uh, we won't have our committee assignments yet. So that policy committee meeting will be um, rescheduled. And also our redistricting committee, study committee, where Zach's in the process of putting together a date. We were trying to grab Margo before December 31st because of her expertise with the last committee that we had regarding redistricting. So we will be having some kind of redistricting meeting before the end of the year. Um, and with that, everyone have a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holidays. Um, I gave a little gift to everybody at your um, place, so enjoy. Um, Thank you. Extra sugar. And what else? Thank you, everyone. We've been a good board. We've been a great yeah. board. Right. And um, it's been a pleasure to work with everyone, and I think everyone will agree that we've, we've had our ups and our downs, but in the long run, we've done a great job. And I'm <laughs> thankful that everyone's here. And Zach, thank you for all you do for us. Oh, thank you. Nathan, thank you for all you do. If Patty were here, we'd, re we'd um, <coughs> acknowledge her too. Danielle and Nathan, Danielle, you've been awesome. Thank You're you. You're a great teacher representative, and Nathan, that report was fabulous. <laughs> thank, thank you. So, do we have a motion to adjourn? And seconded by Margo. At 9:59. <laughs> Their last meeting. Last, last meeting. 9:59. 59. 59. Before 10. 9:59. Right. <laughs> that was great. We're compliant.